G'day there guys, it's your Aussie hubby Marky, back at it again with another r slash legal advice video. Now, if you love me as much as I love you, you know what to do. Mosey on over to that old like button and tackle it like Steve Irwin would a crocodile. Maybe even chuck an Aussie flag down in the comments too. Now, with that out of the way, I want you to sit back, relax, chuck a prawn on the barbie, and get ready for some good content. PhD student being accused of plagiarism, only that it's my own work that I used. Massachusetts. So, I received an email earlier this week from someone in the committee that handles scientific misconduct at my university. The email asked me to meet her to discuss a potential problem with my thesis. I attended the meeting today, and she said that there are seven instances that I've committed plagiarism. I insisted that it isn't true, and asked her to present me the evidence. And she did. All of those seven instances are of me using sentences from my own prior work. Five are from papers that I have already published, and two are from my own master's thesis. She also said part of the source code I used, where the original author was not properly credited. Again, I wrote the code myself, and the original author she is referring to is me. After all of my explanations, she was still insisting that this is unacceptable and violating the proper scientific conduct guidelines of the university. At the end of the meeting, she said that she wasn't convinced by my answer and is going to request a formal investigation by the committee, and she said that I should be prepared for an unfavorable verdict. I should add that I recovered the entire conversation and listened to it again. At three points, she used the term you people or your people, referring to me being Asian and not understanding plagiarism properly. I'm not the sort of person who accuses people of racism where they are critical of my work, but as she's used my ethnicity as part of her judgement of my work there, I don't know, it just sounded weird. What's the next step for me? Do I need to see a lawyer here, or should I let the investigation do its job and wait for their response? Edit, university's guidelines do not include anything about self-plagiarism. Their definition of plagiarism specifically mentioned using someone else's work. Plagiarism aside, I should also add that I recovered the conversation and listened to it again. Did you get consent? Massachusetts is an all-party consent state. If you didn't get her consent, I would not mention it in any meetings. It'll backfire on you big time. And he says, yes, I did. You are awesome. Brilliant. I work with a lot of STEM PhD students in the UK. There is a bit of controversy over what constitutes self-plagiarism. Although I think if a few copied sentences were spotted in a thesis, then the student would be asked to normally sort it out and resubmit. So then I wonder what you mean by instances and sentences. If it is just single sentences or a couple of sentences, then a committee seems a bit over the top although it would be prudent for you to politely apologize and offer to correct it ASAP. Of course, you can get all litigious if you like, but I don't see how that will do you any favors over a simple correction. If we are talking about copy and pasting large sections, i.e. whole paragraphs, etc., of your papers into your thesis, then I think that would be considered by most to be obviously dodgy, by most academics I know. I would then take the approach of apologizing profusely for the misunderstanding and offering to correct ASAP. I would only fight on the technicality of the plagiarism definition if you are otherwise going to be kicked out or something. Even if you win that argument, you probably don't want to make that kind of noise about something that will generally be considered inappropriate, especially if you are considering a career in academia. Apologies if this is more educational advice than legal advice. And they say, a total of seven sentences, 53 words combined, out of a thesis of 95,000 words. Heck, that's not even that much, is it? And now, update. PhD student here being accused of plagiarism, only that it's my own work that I used. So I posted earlier about a plagiarism situation with the university in my PhD thesis. To make it short, a few sentences in the thesis was too similar to what I had said in a couple of my papers and my master's thesis. This wasn't a direct copy and paste, and it was seven sentences, 53 words, out of my thesis which was over 95,000 words. Last week, I got an automated email that an investigation had been started on the recommendation of the person that I talked to. 
The email explained that in case scientific misconduct is found, I will have a chance to defend my case to the board, and the board will decide what to do, which vary from a simple revision and resubmission to presenting the case to the disciplinary committee for a serious offence. I asked for appointments with a few people, head of the department, dean of students, and a head tutor to ask for advice. I haven't managed to see any of them yet. Today I received an email that the investigation is over and they have found no evidence of misconduct or plagiarism. They apologised for the stress that this has caused. A little later, I received another email from the head of the committee personally apologising for this mess, and explaining that the officer who I talked to had gone fishing rather than doing the standard practice which is not the policy. So that's that. Now I can graduate in peace. I cancelled the appointments and decided not to pursue the potential racism situation as there's no point anymore. Thanks for all advice. God, that's one of the most anticlimactic stories on here that I've read, but I'm really happy for them. I still really would want to see them going after the potential racism, but what can you do? And now, scared and want to leave says, I'm pregnant and I want to leave my husband. I have been married for five years, and this is my second pregnancy. I took the test yesterday, and I think I am about six weeks. I had a late miscarriage last time, and the pregnancy was awful. I was very sick. I do not want to be pregnant. My husband found the test, and when I told him I don't want to be pregnant, he said he will not give me permission to have an abortion, and it is fraud for me to get one without him. If I try to leave, he will have me arrested for kidnapping. He said I do not have a valid reason to not want to be pregnant anymore. I have been wanting to leave for some time now and to go to stay with my parents. I cannot use any of the money in the bank for this because they are joint accounts and I do not have my husband's permission. However, I also have a debit card from a joint account with my mother that my husband does not know about. My questions are 1. Is my account with my mum also marital property that I could get into trouble for using without his permission? 2. How likely is it that I will get in trouble if I go to New Hampshire, where my parents live, from Kentucky, where I live now, and lie and say I don't know who the father is, so I can get an abortion? I know it may be illegal, but I am willing to risk it. I can't handle another pregnancy. Thank you in advance for your help, and please don't judge me. And the moderator says here, This is a reminder that how any of us feel about legal abortions is off topic here. Stick to the law as it is, and not how you wish it was. And on that same line of reasoning, just sending moral support to OP is also off topic. This is a legal advice sub, so we're going to keep it on topic. Okay? Okay. So they say, spousal consent isn't required in any state. Such laws have been found to be unconstitutional. The source of the money is irrelevant. Do what you must do for you with regards to the pregnancy. Also, you cannot kidnap a fetus. Your husband is demonstrating classic controlling and manipulative practices, and you should not be taking legal advice from him. On Monday, start talking to divorce attorneys. They say the money in the joint account with your husband is perfectly legal for you to access. He has no rights to the money in the joint account with your mother. You do not need his permission to get an abortion, and even if the baby were already born, there is no such thing as a parent being arrested for kidnapping their own child, unless there is a custody order in place. Custody orders can't be issued until after a child is born. Your husband is exhibiting classic abusive behavior. Get your ID documents and get to a woman's shelter now, if possible. Take out half the money from the joint account. The shelter should have resources to help you make further arrangements, which is lawyers ensuring your phone is clean of trackers and spyware, and access to abortion. Don't know any shelters? National Domestic Violence Hotline is 800-799-SAFE. Quick web search shows Kentucky is one of the most restrictive states regarding abortion. Limits starting as early as 11 weeks, ban after 20. New Hampshire is very liberal. No waiting period, no maximum on gestation. Your abuser is in Kentucky, your support system is in New Hampshire. Head out there and abort, carry to term, indicate father unknown, and surrender the baby to the safe haven law, up to seven days after birth at any hospital, police station, or specific other locations. 
or raise it as a single mother. Edit. One thing that comes up frequently in this sub is do not take legal advice from your opponent. They will lie and advise you to do things that benefit them. Jesus, that is so hairy. Anyway guys, here is the update. Hi everyone. I want to take a minute to say thank you to everyone who gave me advice and words of encouragement. I read every single comment on both threads about my situation, and I really, really appreciate the support and help. If not for the advice here, I probably would not have felt justified in leaving. I'm sorry for taking so long to post, but I am now back home in New Hampshire with my parents. I feel like I'm coming out of a fog, and I feel really stupid for believing everything. I guess I just justified it by assuming laws were different in the South. I left with just my computer, my phone, my documents, and a few family heirlooms. I'm not concerned about my phone being tracked, as I'm still on my dad's phone plan. My husband has sent about 200 texts and has filled my voicemail completely, but I haven't spoken to him. I managed to withdraw half the balance of the two out of the three joint accounts. The third is a local bank, and I did not want to stay in the area any longer. My parents told me just to leave the money. They are going to help me get the medical procedures I need, and then they are going to help me pay for a divorce attorney. I thought they would say, I told you so, because they told me not to get married. But they have been very supportive, and even offered to pay for me to go back to college and finish my degree. Thank you all for all your kind words. And our last one, I'm pregnant and I want to leave my husband, update again. Hi everyone, I'm not sure if anyone remembers my first posts, which I made almost a year ago, but I wanted to come back and update because I got a few PMs, and I just officially finalized my divorce. I got back to New Hampshire, got the medical procedure I needed, and finished up my last few credits. I finally moved out of my parents' house, and I'm starting a career in September. Thanks to my lawyer, I only had to go back to Kentucky twice to finalize my divorce. I only saw my ex then, and when he showed up at my parents' building right after I left. I only saw him for a minute before he got kicked out. He refused to sign the papers, and contested me every step of the way for a while. I know this isn't the ideal solution, but I let him have basically everything in the divorce to keep it from being drawn out. That's basically it. My life is back on track, and I feel like I'm out of a fog. I want to thank you all again for your advice, which helped me get the ball rolling initially, and kept me from staying in a miserable situation. Thank you all again. It's good to know that they had such a happy ending to that one. Anyway guys, on to our next story. Annie sold land around my house to a developer years ago. HOA formed, and being forced to join it and Lien's on my property. So long story short, today has been an absolute crap show, I can't even comprehend where to start. So my parents owned about 30 acres of land in the middle of nowhere Nebraska, on the outskirts of town. My parents built their house in the late 80s, and that's where I lived my whole life. My parents passed away and I inherited the property and it's all my land, or was my land. Back in 2005, this developer bought up a whole bunch of neighboring land and wanted to buy my land. I told him I was willing to sell 10 acres furthest from the house, the adjoining section to his neighborhood. He asked for 20 acres, and I told him that the second 10 acres would be three times the price, and he agreed, and we signed the paperwork, and he bought the land, and I was paid for it. End of story. Or so I thought. The land sat empty for over a decade, since it took a while for him to sell the plots of land he made to home buyers, and his company built houses. From about 2005 to 2012, the land sat empty and I didn't mind. I still mowed the grass and whatnot to keep it tidy, but never tried to take the land over or anything. By fall of last year, he had finished the entire area and there's around 200 homes in that neighborhood. Because of that neighborhood, my 10 acres is now worth about 10 to 20 of what it was originally, and their HOA knows that. Since this September of 2017, I've had a bunch of angry letters and citations left on my property and in my mailbox. Some of them include, having a barn larger than 7x7 feet, I have a 20x40 barn, having abandoned vehicles on my property, 
It's a project car shell that I'm working on. I have the actual chassis in the barn, but it needs quite a bit of work. I bought an old rusted body and it sits outside and will continue to do so until I can deal with it. Having a non-conforming mailbox. Still no idea what the frick this is. Having the improper roof tiles. Again, no idea. I ignored them and told the HOA members that I'm not a part of their neighborhood and therefore have no reason to follow their bullcrap rules. The HOA says since my property values have gone up, I owed back dues from the date I sold my land, before there was even a single house built, and I have to correct everything on the list. The back dues are currently $10,200 but they state that if I don't pay back by December 31st, 2017, I will be charged interest that has accrued. Again, no idea where they are getting this interest from, but I do believe their HOA fees are around $750 a year. It'll cost me about $15,000 to $20,000 to fix my house. I think it's absolute bullcrap that they can even try to make me do so. So one, I went through all the documents I signed, and not a single document from the developer makes any mention of an HOA or my association with it. Two, I have no idea why the HOA is coming after me. I live almost half a mile away from the nearest house that belongs to the neighborhood. The entire neighborhood has its own little custom street signs and lamps. I don't have any of that. So how can they say that I'm part of the HOA? They say to either pay up or they will put a lien on my property and take it over. From what I understand, if I pay the $10,000, doesn't that mean I'm admitting guilt and be forced into the HOA? Update. So just had an hour long discussion with the lawyer and he went through all the documents. He asked if I was sure that was every document and I told him it was. When I sold all the documents, I put them all in the same folder along with my taxes. He says that there is no chance I'm in the HOA since I didn't sign anything. He let them know that he'd be glad to send them a cease and desist letter to the HOA. I brought up adverse possession, and he suggested I don't pursue it since I want them to leave me alone rather than instigate anything bigger. So for now, he said not to pay anyone or sign anything. He'll mail out the CND letter today, and he says if the HOA tries contacting me, I should just tell them to contact him instead. So I think I'm in the clear now. And now, continued. Sold land around my house to a developer years ago, HOA formed, and being forced to join it in Lienz on my property. So I met with a real estate attorney that was referred to me by a Redditor on here, and did the title search, and I'm in the process of trying to find the old developer's master plans. So far, here is what I dug up. I sold my land to developer A. He owned the land for about two years and then filed bankruptcy and lost the land to the bank. That's when the maintenance of the land went to crap and I was mowing it and taking care of it, cause the bank didn't care. Bank sold it to developer B and that is the person that built the current neighborhood. We got in touch with developer B and he said he was no longer part of the neighborhood and in fact, the HOA is in charge of the entire area. His company just owned the lots and they sold slash built on them for the families and they have zero say anymore. I asked him about the master plans and if he thought he owned my remaining 10 acres and he said absolutely not. The entire neighborhood sits on old land plus the 20 acres that were purchased from in. So he was helpful and it was clear he had no wrongdoing. I spoke to the lawyer to see if we could file and adverse possession on the land that I maintained, but he said it would be a waste of time and money. But I was just going to do it to spite the HOA. The title search and everything came up clean. It showed my parents as the previous owners and then me. So no way they could have owned my land. The records go way back and there is a clear chain of ownership as my lawyer put it, and it's incontestable. We sent the HOA a cease and desist letter, as well as to stop contacting me unless they have actual signed documents that show I was part of an HOA. They never got back to me. I was out of town and came back last night to my mailbox missing. It was cut clear off the post with a chainsaw, wooden post with a metal mailbox on top. I told my lawyer this and he says that it is a big deal and that USPS would send the person to jail. 
I repurchased an identical mailbox and set up cameras all over the property. If they try it again, I'll have them on tape. But the biggest thing we uncovered was that we found out what they are planning. Turns out that the HOA wants to put in another community playground and a pool slash clubhouse, and they need land. They can't expand in any other direction since they're almost on the end of a highway on one side and the other sides are zoned for agriculture. They decided they would try to take over my land. They have yet to file a lien on my property. So I'm guessing they were trying to force me into the HOA to make me sell them my land below market value? Either way, they showed their hand and now I'm on alert. We filed a complaint with the police regarding the stolen mailbox and we have a paper trail for that now. It is just a waiting game to see what they do next. Should I send them a letter saying that I know their plan and there is no way they can get my land? They have their monthly meeting every second Tuesday of the month, so it's in a few days and I'm sure I'll be a topic of discussion. Should I go to it? Don't engage. Contact them only through the lawyer and do not go to the meeting. I know you're angry, but they're trying to upset you to the point of leaving. Don't engage and make yourself into the bad guy. Also, having only contact through your lawyer creates a very clear paper trail, and they can never say you promised something you didn't. I asked my lawyer if I should go to the meeting, and he said absolutely not, and all communication should go through him. I just didn't know if he said that to raise his fees, but it seems like everyone agrees that my lawyer should handle it, so I'll let him deal with it. It's not that he wants to raise his fees, it's to protect you. Especially since some of your neighbors are escalating to harassing behavior considering they stole your mailbox. If you went to the meeting and they egged you into making angry statements, they could go to the police and claim that you threatened them, which would then start a paper trail on you. By working solely through the lawyer, you're recording all of their misdeeds and showing that you're operating within the law. So if it ever comes to a lawsuit, you can prove that you've always been on the up and up. Don't let them drag you down to their level in the mud. And our last update. HOA towed away my car and built a chain link fence on my land. So this is part three and most likely the final update for now. So I was away for the holidays and came back on Monday to find my project car was towed out of my driveway. My pond was emptied out and filled with gravel and sand and a fenced off two acres. Two chains by one furlong of my property closest to the HOA. I immediately called the police and filed a report regarding the stolen property. The car wasn't registered and it was just an empty shell. So I have no idea where it is, nor will it be easy to track. It's not worth a lot, maybe two and a half thousand dollars, but it's the principle of that jerk president of the HOA. I had my lawyer draft up the cease and desist and sent it nearly two weeks ago, and they haven't contacted me in any way except this. I hired a local salvage company to come tear up the fence this weekend, and they are doing it free of charge, since I'm letting them keep the fence to sell as scrap metal, or whatever they do with it. My lawyer suggested I send up a letter demanding payment to fix my pond, as it was filled in with gravel and sand. A local landscape company quoted me nearly $8,000 to get the pond back to the way it was, so that is what he suggested I ask, and another $2,000 for the loss of use of the pond. The HOA is lawyered up, so I think it's best no longer to post anything else on here until it's settled. I don't want to leave you all without some closure, since you all have been amazing help. I've put a picture of the layout since a few people asked. It's bad, but should convey the land. Oh boy. <laughs> More Microsoft Paint, yes! Beautiful. Oh, I didn't realize that the HOA was so close to his house. What the hell? Whoa. I thought it was like, you know, a mile down the road or something. It's like literally right there. Good stuff. And our last story, guys. This is a bit of a doozy. My ex has nude photos of me and threatens to send them to my current partner. Oh no. Can I do anything? So I sent my ex and father of my kids risque photos pretty often when we were together. When we broke up, I deleted all of his permanently and requested he do the same. I thought he had. We are currently in the middle of a custody issue and he is not handling it well. 
between me not doing everything that he wants me to do, and coming down from relapsing on heroin for over a month, he is not in the best mental state. This is unlike him. This morning, he sent my current partner old pictures, two plus years, and attempted to convince him they were recent. Luckily, there are some pretty noticeable differences between the pictures and how I look now. I am wondering if I have any legal recourse here. I want the pictures off his phone and I want to make sure that he has not and will not post them anywhere or share them with anyone else. Are there any laws in PA or precedents that say what he did was somehow illegal? Thank you in advance. This sucks, but the easiest thing to do is notify your attorney and notify the family court judge of this behavior. There may be other legal remedies in PA for this, but how many different ways do you need to stop your ex? My biggest concern is making sure he deletes the photos and any others he has saved up. A lawyer won't scare him enough to do that. Honestly, the police is still a 50-50 chance. He isn't in the best state of mind right now, obviously. All more reason to notify your attorneys of the pictures and potentially provide them as evidence to keep your kids away from him. I know it's easier said than done, but I would try to remember that regardless of what he chooses to do with the photos, you have done nothing wrong and you have nothing to be ashamed of. There is nothing wrong with sharing intimate photos of yourself with someone you love and trust. Your body is nothing to be ashamed of, nor is being in a sexually active relationship. The only person who has done anything wrong is him. He has abused your trust and done something really despicable, which does nothing more than demonstrate the sort of person that he is, not the person you are. If he sends the pictures to anyone else, just remember, there is nothing wrong with photos of your naked body. There is everything wrong with what he has chosen to do with them. They said, that just made me tear up. Thank you for reminding me of all that. I needed to hear it. Logically, I know better than to be embarrassed about the photos being sent. Emotionally, I am not on that level yet. So having my current partner see photos meant for a previous partner threw me into a little emotional upheaval. Thank you so much, I really needed that. And on to our next update. My post was not hugely popular, but I have a small update. Thank you to everyone who commented on my previous post, I read all of them, even the ones I didn't reply to immediately. I called the police last night. An officer came out to my house. He read the messages, saw the photos, and said, yeah, that's illegal, and I don't think it gets much easier to prosecute than this. He had my fiance send him screenshots of everything, and then the photos separately. He took my ex's information, our information, and the surprisingly ample amount of information I have on his girlfriend. My ex is currently on both probation and parole, so the officer is reaching out to his parole officer today for a current address, since he refused to provide it to them. He'll be calling my ex today, and if he hangs up on him or gets smart, He'll be prepared with an address to just go talk to him. He also knows where he is working this evening while the officer is on duty, so that is a last resort. He's also going to run the evidence and our statements by the DA's office today and get the green light to proceed with charges, which apparently will include an actual arrest once everything that needs to happen happens. I'm not clear on the details exactly, I just know that there are almost certainly going to be charging him with a dis misdemeanor or two. Additionally, I am almost positive that my ex's current girlfriend, who he has been with for roughly 9 months now, was involved in some manner. She is an RN, so if it comes to light that she was complicit, she could be also charged and lose her job. I don't know how it would impact her license as an RN, but I did work for the hospital she works for currently, and any charges, no matter how minor, result in termination. The officer confirmed this as well. And I took everyone's advice. I contacted my attorney. He is drafting a cease and desist letter to send to both my ex and his current partner. He is also going to request a copy of the police report to add to the already massive stack of evidence of reasons why he should not get custody of either of his kids. He should remain strictly on visitation if he is lucky enough to even get that. Thank you to everyone. I have a small amount of hope that this will work out favorably. My current partner doesn't care what he has to say or what pictures he sends. He sees it every day. 
He also knows that my ex is vindictive and is grasping at straws in an adult temper tantrum. Hopefully, this will end the years of this crap from my ex, as this is not the first partner he has done this with. It's just finally a charge in PA. And our last update, guys, there's an update too. Well, this is a pretty lackluster letdown of an update. I finally heard back from the police officer who took the official report. He said that the DA was declining to press charges, and I'm devastated. Essentially, when the officer spoke to my ex, he claimed that he did not send those pictures because I was nude, but only because he wanted to show my current partner the background to establish a timeline. That is stupid for a couple of reasons. First of all, the first picture he sent, I was at work, at my current job. I've been here for four years, and much of that time I was dating my ex. So that picture proves absolutely nothing. Second, the second picture he sent was taken in the bathroom of a house I rented prior to meeting my current partner, and while still dating my ex. He was even there when the lease was signed, so again that proves nothing for the supposed timeline he was trying to establish. From what the officer was told, my ex's word was that he didn't send those pictures because I was nude, but because of the background, is what tipped the scales in his favor. The DA said that there is no intent to disseminate those photos because of what my ex claims was his reasoning. I don't understand that either, considering he did disseminate them. He sent them to my partner. I'm still confused about the logic there. The kicker in all of this is that I have proof via cell phone records of all of my own that I sent my ex other pictures in the same time frame that were not nude, that had the same background as the nude photos he sent. It is very frustrating for me that the DA didn't even take that into account. The officer attempted to elaborate on the situation and explain that there was additional evidence that could be gathered from my cell phone carrier that would absolutely destroy my ex's claims, but he got nowhere. I have attempted to call the DA's office myself, and they have yet to return a phone call. They are obviously not interested at all. There was a case tried in my state for a situation that sounded eerily similar to mine, but the DA in my county doesn't want to bother. Sorry this is a crap update, and sorry for the lack of justice boners. I'm pretty devastated, and I feel very let down. I know there isn't anything I can do at this point, my lawyer is still obtaining a copy of the police report to use in our custody case. But without any charges filed, I doubt it will hold much weight. We have a child support conference last week. He lied about his income and where he worked and what hours. So he managed to get out of paying a fair amount. He was high during the conference. He came in and used the bathroom while my mom and I sat there. Hopefully the custody isn't as big as a letdown as everyone else has been so far. Thanks for your help, everyone. We tried. And our first post is by Trevor Chico, titled, Car Dealer Swapped the Car, Found Out the Next Day, California. Last Friday, my sister bought a new car in Oakland, California. She test drove an all-wheel drive Toyota RAV4. She signed the paperwork and drove off. She noticed the all-wheel drive button was not there. They switched it for the two-wheel drive. Dealer refuses to take the car back, wants an additional 8k for the all-wheel drive version. She contacted the three lenders that hit her credit, and was able to cancel the loans before any were approved. She froze her credit with the three bureaus. She is making a police report tomorrow, and has Toyota Motors involved, but they are almost zero help. She is trying to get the police to take the car as evidence, and I don't think they will. I assume the dealer will try and self-finance the car from here. Anything else she can do here? Looking at small claims court now. Edit, she found out that the car was technically not new, but a rollback from when financing fell through. They did not disclose this. Edit two, she has a text saying, let me look into this to see if it was a mistake or spec, or if you were actually sold the wrong car, and if so, I'll see what they can do to fix it. Update, the dealership got it financed. A contingency attorney who only sues dealerships has signed into the case. The case was not disclosed as used. It was sold prior as a spot delivery. The financing fell through with that buyer, and in California, you have to disclose that. 
She's entitled to the car described by VIN on her contract to purchase, and obligated to pay for that car. It seems like an intentional misrepresentation, deceit, or concealment of a material fact known to the defendant. A clear case of fraud in California. What evidence of that fraud does she have? The contract to purchase is the entirety of the transaction. She would need something compelling to make a fraud case. OP wasn't given the car she purchased, and was asked to pay more when she went to get the actual car. Important info. Did the paperwork list the vehicle as all-wheel drive or two-wheel drive? Is the VIN, also on the paperwork, a match for the vehicle currently in her possession? Paperwork does not say it's two-wheel drive or all-wheel drive. The VIN does match the car. Well, if the VIN matches, then the dealership did nothing wrong. They sold her the correct car. And update, car dealer swapped the car, found out the next day. This didn't get a lot of attention, but I thought I would share because everybody said my sister was out of luck, but she prevailed. She found an attorney to work on contingency who litigates dealerships in the area. After reading the contract she signed, he took the case. Once she told the dealership she retained an attorney, they said we'll give you your money back and your old car, but you have to come in and sign today. She said no, send me the paperwork that you want me to sign so my attorney can review. They told her to go pound sand. The attorney called them that week and they buckled, returned the deposit and her old car. I guess they didn't disclose that the car had been sold prior as a spot delivery, but the original buyer returned the car when financing fell through. So if you're scammed by a shady dealership, have an attorney read your paperwork. Her attorney was really nice to her and said he put almost no time into it and didn't charge her or get anything out of it. What a nice guy. And our next post by Tyler's Hot Wheels, titled, Can my mum stop paying child support because I don't want to go to her place? I'm 16. My parents got a divorce when I was four. The custody agreement is that I live with my dad and go to my mum's every other weekend. There was an issue with my mum's boyfriend, and now my dad has decided I won't be going anymore. That's what I want. I didn't go this weekend as planned, and she's mad about it. She has texted me that from now on, she stops paying child support since I don't go anymore. She says now she doesn't have to spend money on me since I'm not going to see her, I'm not her responsibility anymore. Thing is, my dad really needs that money. He works hard, but we're not doing that well financially. Can she do that? Thank you. I'm in Ohio, if that matters. So, child support is not an access fee. It's a measure to share the burden of raising a child. Even if your mother had no right to see you at all for some reason, she would still owe support if a court has ordered her to pay it. Your father can and should go through the state's Office of Child Support to enforce the support order. He should also ensure that he complies with any orders regarding visitation which may mean making you available to her for scheduled times, whether you like it or not. Your dad should not be encouraging the breakdown of your relationship with your mother or violating his half of their custody orders. Okay, thank you. My dad doesn't want to hurt my relationship with my mom, but he's afraid her boyfriend is going to abuse me. Usually he makes me go even when I drag my feet, but this time he said no way. The presence of an abusive person is also something to bring up when talking to the Office of Child Support. You should not be forced into an unsafe situation. And now, update. Can my mum stop paying child support because I don't want to go to her place? Many people were worrying about me, so here is an update. I'm safe at my dad's place. My dad just talked to a lawyer on the phone about custody. The lawyer told him to file for emergency custody. He said it shouldn't be difficult to get full custody in these circumstances, and since I'm 16, I can be heard if I say that's what I want. So I'll be safe, they can't make me go to my mum's, and she can't stop paying child support. My mum also texted me that finally she believed me. That usually doesn't happen. I'm glad she did this time. I'm surprised that she did actually. She confronted her boyfriend and he said he talked to me about porn, but he wasn't aware that would be a problem. She pretends he's apologizing. I'm not sure of that, to be honest. Anyway, she won't be kicking him out for the time being, so I won't be going to her place. I'm tired of her drama anyway. My auntie made me promise I will talk to the school counselor when the school reopens. 
She says what happened is not normal and I need to talk to someone, and that will do me good anyway. I'm not sure I want to do that, but I promised so I will. This was a difficult moment for me, I was very worried. But you people helped about custody and child support and all, and that made it easier, so a big thank you. Actually, I showed my post to my dad this morning, and that was easier than telling him certain things. Before, he was saying that Reddit is a waste of time, maybe he'll change his mind. And our next post. My girlfriend is being harassed by her co-worker over the coronavirus. So my girlfriend has lupus and asthma. One day, about a week ago, she had trouble breathing and it got bad enough an ambulance came out and gave her a breathing treatment. Since then, her co-worker, who is an older woman, has been causing scenes at work about her even when she's nowhere near her, accusing her of putting everyone at risk and refusing to go where she's been. The manager sent her co-worker home one day because she wouldn't stop. Today, she found out her co-worker called the CDC and reported her and has been trying to get other employees on board to get rid of my girlfriend. My girlfriend shows no symptoms. Because of her condition, she already took tons of steps to stay clean and healthy, so we were already prepared when all this started. It has been extremely hard on her since she already hates being in the condition she's in. Is there anything we can do? Edit, thank you everyone for the advice. As of now, she's filed a report with the store manager for harassment. Being a small company, they don't have HR. So from there, their manager will be involved. Apparently, they're saying that the store is considered disaster relief, so they are not shutting down. I will be talking to her about still taking time off though. I know she's afraid of losing her job or not being able to keep up with the bills, but we will make it happen. Thanks guys. So JCWA50 says, OP. Your girlfriend needs to document everything, keep all the texts and emails, and then look at her boss, and say that this is starting to look like harassment, abusive and possibly hostile, that either the co-worker needs to stop this. Speaking of the boss, does he know what the medical issues are around your girlfriend? He may need to be informed as such, even given medical information about such, so he knows and then he has to take action because this could get to a point where he and the company could get into a lawsuit that can cost, well, the kind of cost gets managers terminated, along with other people for allowing this to happen. Now, if there is an HR, get them involved. I have asked her to document everything and keep whatever is related. Her job is aware of her condition. And I just really wanted to read this one. I'm sorry that there isn't an update to this post, but I thought it was you know, important that we're aware of what's going on out there. And our next post, Wallach Matolik says, Cuomo signs bill to guarantee sick leave for New Yorkers during COVID-19 outbreak. Hey all, I have a small business with 25 employees in New York City. Governor Cuomo has recently signed this law into place and it states, medium-sized employers, which includes employers with 10 or fewer employees that have a net income of greater than $1 million and employers with between 11 and 99 employees would receive at least five days of paid sick leave, followed by eligibility for paid family leave and TDI benefits. Due to everything going on, we will most likely have to shut down tomorrow. I'm trying to figure out what is the best to do for my employees. With this new law in effect, if I do not lay them off, does that mean we are required to pay them five days of sick leave or anything else? Given our industry, I don't believe they would look for work anywhere else or be able to find it. Would you suggest laying everyone off and providing them info on how to file for unemployment benefits and then rehire when things calm down? I am drafting out an email to them all now, so I appreciate the help. Do you have a lawyer you work with normally? If so, I'd ask him to review the email first. Better to pay him a small fee than to deal with a wage complaint or lawsuit. Unfortunately not. I did make sure everything would be okay with our accountant and work as comp rep. Both said this would be fine, and seems to be becoming the standard in our area right now. Please, please, please don't take legal advice from accountants or insurance reps. Yes, many of them like to play lawyer or think they have a grasp on the law. They don't. These are complicated issues that can open you up to real liability. Hell, even if there isn't liability, the cost of defending a bogus lawsuit can bankrupt many companies. You need to have a relationship with a lawyer or a small law firm that can help with business issues and employment law issues. 
Yes, it's going to cost money, but in the end, it'll be cheaper than the alternative. And I guess I liked this one on here because it gives you an idea of the other side of business owners and what they're going through during this time, so there's a lot of hard decisions being made right now. Oregon. Neighbor cut down several trees on my property, claiming they were a hazard. What do I do? Would you look at that, it's tree law. Hi, a friend told me to check this sub out for legal advice. I'm not sure whether this is worth getting a lawyer over, but I am pretty ticked. So I moved into my current house about two years ago. It's a beautiful three acre property, mostly flat, except for about a dozen large trees bordering part of a road that runs alongside my property. I'm not sure what type they are, but they're pretty big. I think they're oaks? I love them. They provide some great shade in the summer during part of the day and are just pretty. My neighbor doesn't like them. He's not really my neighbor, since his house is quite a bit down the road, but he is the closest one to me. When I first moved in, he came over and introduced himself and asked if I planned to do anything about the trees. I was confused and told him no. He told me a little bit before I moved in, one of the trees had a branch break off and fall into the road, causing an obstruction that lasted a whole day. According to him, anyway. He said the previous owner didn't care and didn't cut down the trees, but he, the neighbor, hoped that I would. I told him I would talk to the previous owner and see about it. I did that, and though it was two years ago, as I recall, the owner told me he went out and moved the branch the moment he saw it. We talked a bit more, and I decided to not cut the trees down. Like I said, I liked them. Anyways, that's all the backstory that I think matters. So I was away this past week slash weekend, visiting family for our annual reunion. I come back and honestly almost drove past my own house, because I was so used to seeing the line of trees, and they weren't there. He cut down all my trees. I immediately went and asked him, and he said that he had them removed due to being a hazard, and that it was legal because the city signed off on it. I was livid, but just left, and told him to stay off my property. There aren't even stumps, guys. They are completely gone. I asked my other neighbors, one who lives down the road the opposite way, and another across the way, what happened, and they said he had a company come out there cutting them all down all week. One of them asked him about it, and apparently he showed them some document from the city, and that gave him permission to remove the trees. Is that true? Can he just remove my trees? Should I call a lawyer about this? Should I call the city? I don't even know where to start. It's left that whole area of my property an ugly strip of dirt and loose earth. I know the trees are definitely on my property. The previous owner and real estate agent walked around with me, and I remember them showing me the extent of the property, and it's not like the trees are right up against the road. The trunks were like 15 to 20 feet in from the road, and were probably like 15 feet apart. I'm not sure, but they stretched a pretty good amount along the road, and some of the branches definitely hung over the road. What should I do? Edit, so I've meticulously been checking this for comments. Thank you so much to everyone who has offered advice. I also called the previous owner, who was rather surprised to hear from me, and told him what happened. He was also ticked. He told me those trees had been there since before he bought the house, 20 something years ago, and he also told me what kind. He says they were white oaks, but I'm gonna go with what some people suggested and hire an arborist to come out. By the way, I should have been more clear, Whoever removed the trees didn't take out all the stumps. I mean like the classic two feet stump wasn't there. They were trimmed down to like a few inches. Barely noticeable, and there is still lots of loose dirt. Like they tried digging or something. I also saw the comment about a paint sketch and made one. So there you go guys, I hope you like it. It's neighbor's house, road, trees. My property is all this square plus more and down where my driveway is, and to the right a bit, and that's my house. That's a lot of damn trees to remove, not gonna lie. I'm going to talk to the police tomorrow, and see if I can talk to whoever is in charge of these matters with the city. Hopefully they can tell me if they gave permission to my neighbor or not. Thanks everyone. Quick update. Hi everyone! This blew up overnight, and I am so thankful for all the advice. 
This was a busy morning, but I think I'm on the right track. Some of your comments were shocking. Are trees really worth that much? I know my neighbor is a little wealthy since he told me about a summer house he has in Sun River. Is that okay that I mention the general area of his summer home? But I don't know if he paid for this or what. I went to the police first thing and asked to report trespassing and possible vandalism. The officer took down my story and I even brought him some photos, which he asked to keep. He then told me, and this kind of ticked me off, that unless I had proof of my neighbor cutting these trees down or giving authorization to cut them down, it may turn into my word against my neighbors. He suggested I just pursue this in court myself. Is he right? I don't want to question a police officer, but I want to be sure. So while at the police station, I asked who I would talk to specifically with the city about permits and tree removals. And the officer told me to try the public works, which matched what a user commented. Thank you. I went home and called them. The lady asked for my street address so she could check it against their records. And I did, and she found nothing. Not a single thing. She said there was nothing regarding my address or property in the last six weeks. I noted that and thanked her. Then I called an arborist, like many of you suggested, and made an appointment for later this week. She, the arborist, also asked that I have some photos of the trees when she comes, which is fine since I have more. Finally, I looked up companies that do landscaping or logging or tree removal, covering all my bases, since I really don't know who would handle the tree removal anywhere other than a forest. Anyways, after calling a few places, I got one who confirmed that they did the job, and told me they were following a city order. That call was after I called the lady at the public works for the city, and she told me there was no record of my address. Did my neighbor lie to this company? They didn't ask me for more details, and when I asked who showed them the order, they said they couldn't tell me. WTF? Is that true? I'm going to look up some law offices in my general area and reach out about all of this. Does this fall under a specific type of law office? Like, should I hire a specific lawyer? Sorry, I'm really out of my league here. I'll let you all know what happens though. Thank you again for the support and great advice and support. Edit to quick update. The company was a tree service by the way. Didn't even know that was a business type. They aren't exactly local, but relatively close by. They didn't tell me what happened to those trees either. Looks like Oregon has a treble damages tree law. You might want to look into that. Your neighbor might need to sell his house to pay for these trees, lol. Crap, man. The trees themselves are probably conservatively around $10,000 a pop. I'm no arborist, but that seems to be the minimum value for a up to 20 year old tree. There are 12 of them in the paint sketch, so that's $120,000 right there. Treble damages makes it $360,000, and that's a low conservative estimate. Not to mention the labor to actually transport and plant them. Oof. Based on my recollection of my arborist days, simply moving mature white oak trees any significant distance, which involves digging them up, lifting them, containering them, think a very, very big wooden bucket, about a half the size of the crown of the tree, lifting them onto a truck, getting that oversized load to the site, off the truck, and into the very big hole you've dug, is going to run something like $15,000 each, before you even add in the cost of the tree itself. I just described a two to three month process, since trees aren't exactly migratory and don't really enjoy moving. There are a few hundred man hours involved in this scale of a project, and those aren't unskilled laborers either. My days of being a certified arborist are long behind me, and it was the other guys in my company that did projects like this. But my best guess is that purchasing and relocating 10 mature white oaks is going to run closer to $500,000, based on a sale price of $20,000 each, and adding in the moving costs. That doesn't mean that a judge will necessarily agree with the number, but I think that it's a more accurate starting point. And now guys, update! Neighbor cut down trees on my property! Hello, legal advice community! I have not forgotten about you, who helped me set me on the path to justice. I'll just get right to it. I can't speak to all the details, and I'm sorry about not continuing the update, 
After everything got underway, I figured it would be best not to. To keep it short, we, my lawyer and I, spoke to the police, who then spoke to my neighbors down and across the street, the one who witnessed my trees getting cut down, who stated that they saw my neighbor in the company cutting down the trees, and then finally they spoke to him, the neighbor. I don't know much beyond that with the criminal investigation. What happened with the whole city document or the company, and why that is will be explained below. I hauled his ass into court. Well, first, the arborist came, as did the surveyor. The trees were on my property, and they were white oaks. The arborist gave me an estimate on having 15 mature white oaks brought and replanted onto my property, which was just shy of $650,000. Though, he did say some trees would die, and that would drive the cost up. I also had my property appraised, for the difference before and after losing the trees. It then became a question of whether I wanted to pursue my lost trees, and see how much their lumber was worth, or sue for the replacement cost and loss of property value. Basically, do I want the trees back, or do I want the cost of the ones I lost? Apparently, you can't have both. Well guys, I picked the trees. The actual court stuff started a lot sooner than I thought. We filed, a few weeks passed, and a few days before our day in court, his lawyer reached out with a settlement offer. Apparently, he was wealthier than I thought. We accepted, and while I can't speak to the details of it, I'm getting the trees back. It's going to take a long time apparently. Several months, possibly all the way until September, since the process didn't start until just this week due to the holidays but I will have all 12 trees back on my property at no cost to me. My neighbor has also put his house up for sale, and I haven't seen him for quite some time now. Oh well. There's a bit more to this settlement, but I don't feel comfortable speaking to that. Hopefully that's understandable. I remember some of the comments about whether the trees were a hazard to the road based on how far they were from the road. I ended up having to check with the county, not the city and they sent someone out to measure and mark the boundaries. My trees were at least five feet beyond it, so outside the boundary, not even close. Just thought that I would add that in. Anyways, there it is. I plan to take photos of the trees once they start getting put in. And of course, once they are all in place and I have them back. I'll be sure to share them. I want to thank everyone for all the advice. It was a huge help. I didn't know you were all so into trees, but I'm glad you are. Have a good one, everyone. Now, I know how much you hate liars in this community. Yes, I know, I'm sorry. He lied about posting the video of the tree. Um, can we get a rip this man's white oaks in the chat? Uh, also, wow, I, I can't believe I've been lied to. But what a good story. And our last post. The CEO of the charity I volunteer at is exploiting workers, moonlighting as a slumlord, and is acting as if OSHA and the FLSA don't apply to charities. So, this is employment law. I'd like to apologize ahead of time for the whole lot there is to read here, and that there are a bunch of questions slash issues packed in together. I tried to put them as nicely together as I could. This is happening in PA. For years now, I have volunteered with an organization that does a lot of good, it is a registered charity, and almost everyone who works there is a volunteer. However, there are several paid positions, most notably the vet and the clinic manager, who I believe are being exploited. I will just lay it all out, because I suspect some of this has to be illegal slash reportable, but I'm not sure which bits. The two girls could also really use any cash they could get from the back pay as well, but I don't want to get their hopes up and suggest to see someone without some sort of confirmation that they'd have a chance. I have watched several wonderful people come to work for this organization, filled with a desire to do good, only to be exploited and broken down by the demands of the person at the top, who owns the charity. About a year ago, our last clinic manager quit, because the job was destroying her mental, emotional, and physical health. We went four to six months with no clinic manager, and it was a mess. Finally, the quote-unquote CEO of the organization found a new clinic manager, a 19-year-old who was in a crappy situation. 
The CEO installed this girl as our new clinic manager and rented the apartment above our clinic to her and her then 17 year old sister who was fleeing parental abuse. It's a long story, so I'll stick to the things I think might be violations. Specific to the two girls. The 19 year old was told she was classified as an independent contractor, which seems to be a misclassification according to the stuff I read online, since she was on constant call and her position was the very definition of the clinic's day-to-day -day work. She was told she would be working for free for her first week as a quote-unquote trial. There doesn't seem to be any paperwork involved in a lot of this. When the 19-year-old was offered the job, she was promised a lease and a work contract, neither of which was ever provided. The 17-year-old signed a typical volunteer form, and there is one printed out record of a payment two months after they started with the rent cut out, but that's it for paperwork either of them ever saw or signed. The clinic manager was told from the beginning that it would be a 50 hours per week job, and that she would be paid 40 hours a week after the 60 day trial period if she was able to keep up. In the meantime, she would be paid 20 hours a week. In actuality, she worked about 60 to 80 hours a week, in addition to being constantly on call, including the frequently, well, since you lived right above the clinic, go down and do this for me. Her then 17 year old sister would also work these long hours next to her, not being paid, just not wanting her sister to have to do the massive workload alone, and also having a love of rescue. They were never given an actual lease, which meant the 17 year old, recently 18 year old, has not been able to establish residency and therefore can't get on any sort of social services. Some background on that. The 17 year old fled her abusive mother from another state, who threatened to call the cops, claiming that she was kidnapped if she established residency, but would allow her to stay with her sister otherwise, I'm guessing for tax reasons? At one point, the girls were told to leave the apartment for a day and make it look unlived in while an inspector came by. There was an emergency exit stairs recently built, which has a board nailed over it from the inside. The stairs going up to the apartment have clearly sunk half an inch away from where they started on the wall, leading to you feeling like you were running downhill when you walk down them. The apartment has no laundry, originally the girls would just use the clinic downstairs laundry. Once the CEO fired the older girl, all the volunteers were very upset, and the CEO told the girls they were no longer allowed in the clinic because they are making her look like a monster. At that point, the girls had no ways to do laundry for a bit over a month until they moved out. Payment for the apartment was taken directly out of one of the two paychecks the 19 year old got. When the CEO fired the older girl, she offered that she could still work off the cost of the apartment. When the 19 year old said no thanks, the CEO then upped the rent by an extra 100. And generally for the clinic itself, there are no OSHA or FLSA posters anywhere in the clinic. There is no eyewash station, and I feel like there should be one. We deal with all sorts of stuff that would be bad to get in your eyes. There are no fire extinguishers. Again, I don't know for sure, but I feel like we should have a few. The place is made of wood and we use oxygen tanks. Tons of hazards, very little to zero training on them or anything. There is no breaks. I, as a volunteer, commonly work eight to 10 hours with no break, but that is a choice I make as no one really takes a break. The vets get no breaks and gets yelled at over taking one minute bathroom break over this time period. I always have to force the vet to stop 30 seconds to eat or drink once or twice a day cause she gets hangry but is afraid the moment she chooses to eat is the moment the CEO will walk in screaming at her. The tables for surgery are the wrong height for the vet and non-adjustable. The CEO often goes against the vet's advice, even on things such as bite protocols or when animals come in with wounds of unknown origin. The vet says they need to be quarantined and watched. The CEO puts them right back out. The CEO takes money out of the vet's paycheck for things she did not consent to and things that didn't happen. There is more I'll probably think of later, but that's all for now. I can elaborate on any of the points you have questions on. Now, the CEO also treats volunteers like crap, and over the last year, I have watched as almost everyone that was there when I started has left one by one, 
100% from the treatment of the CEO. I understand none of this is legally actionable, but I will say I am sick and tired of watching this abuse. Our organization does a lot of good, and on the other hand, I hate the idea of causing it bad press that could influence the number of donations we get. But that's one for a moral sub, not a legal sub. Main bits that I'd like advice on. Is anything I have listed something that is somehow legally actionable or reportable? And if so, what do I do about it? Is there anything I could recommend the vet who recently quit or the now fired clinic manager do? Could the clinic manager be entitled to back pay? I think so from what I read upon it, but I'd like a more qualified opinion. I'd really, really love any advice to place or start on how to get the now 18 year old onto some sort of social services. She is currently living with my mum in Delaware, but her last documented residence was in Florida and there is no lease since my mum is letting them stay for free until they can find a place. So nothing to show the DMV. She also doesn't have her driver's license, GED, or high school diploma, and I want to somehow get her on track for that as well. I should add that the CEO created and owns the organization, is very well known within the org for being massively spiteful, and has screw you levels of money. I don't want to suggest anything to anyone that will end up hurting them. Honestly, I'm really not sure what to do, but would really appreciate some advice. And not quite good enough -er says, Call OSHA directly yourself and report your concerns about the safety issues. They will apprise you on if they are actionable, etc. These workers need to contact the PA Department of Labor directly to file a claim on wage theft. Thanks. Is it simply a matter of calling them up and telling them the whole story, and they give advice? Yes. PA doesn't have a state OSHA, so you'll deal directly with the feds. They deal with both for-profits and non-profits. It says you can file a complaint by calling your local OSHA regional office. In states with approved state plans, employees may file a complaint with both the state and federal OSHA. If there is any emergency or the hazard is immediately life-threatening, call your local OSHA regional office or 1-800-321-OSHA. Good luck. Someone I've never met claims they own my house. Hi everyone. I wanted to get your opinion on something troubling. I will try to be as detailed as I can be. We live in New York City, if that helps. We were just away on vacation for a week and came back home yesterday. When we returned, among the other junk mail, there was a letter from a law firm for a person whose name I'd never heard before, directed to our address. It said something along the lines of, we've received notice that a foreclosure action has been filed against you. Please call us and we can represent you. It also listed the names of the two people involved in the lawsuit, as well as an incident number for the county clerk's office. This letter isn't an official letter, more of trying to drum up business for the law firm. We returned on Sunday, so were unable to get in touch with the county clerk until this morning. This morning we called the county clerk's office, and they said there's a Liz Pendens filed on our property, not a foreclosure. We said how can this be possible? We've never missed a mortgage payment and have lived here for over six years. We had a title search and checked for Leon's when we purchased the house, and we know the last three families to live here over the past 20 years. And it ain't these guys. We've never heard of either of these people involved in this lawsuit. The clerk couldn't really advise us, but gave us the name of the law firm who initiated the action, so we called them. They told us that the person in the letter, who we have never met, spoken to, or had any dealings with whatsoever, is being sued because the law firm's client was in dealings with him to buy foreclosures to flip, but now is out a lot of money due to some nefarious dealings on the part of the first guy. Apparently, this con artist was required by the law firm to provide deeds to any properties he owns, and among others, he provided one for our address. How he got this, I don't know. I assume that he made it in Photoshop or something. He claims he owns our house and the one across the street. I have no idea if he actually owns the one across the street or not, but we are still listed as the owners of our home in public records and we have the deed. I cannot stress enough how much we do not know the man claiming to own our house. 
We have never met, spoken to, or had any dealings with him whatsoever. We had never even heard his name until yesterday. Our house has never been in foreclosure, while we've owned it, and for any owners before that. We have an appointment for a consult with a lawyer on Wednesday, the one who helped us buy our house six years ago, coincidentally. But I have no idea what's going on or what this guy hopes to gain, how big of a deal this is or how complicated this will be to fix. Any guidance or advice anyone can offer in advance with our meeting with our lawyer would be very helpful. Thank you all. Edit. Thank you all so much for all your guidance. Figures that post I made about potentially getting screwed is the one that takes off. Here's some more information based on everyone's comments. The chance that this guy has a legitimate claim to our house is 0.000001%. Only a Sith deals in absolutes, so I don't want to say that the chance is nil. But this guy is a known con man, being sued for conning someone else. I looked his name up online, and apparently he keeps creating new real estate companies to fleece people out of money, then escapes into the night. He's done it at least three times that I can find, based off dismissal reviews of his real estate companies. Unfortunately, I can't speak to the people across the street, because that was a flip that hasn't been sold yet. He may or may not actually own it, I have no idea. At this point, we are not personally involved in this lawsuit, our property is just associated with it. The con man hasn't made any attempts to acquire our property, he's just lying to the law firm suing him, saying he already bought it. Why, I don't know. The only thing that I can think of is that he bought no properties with the money his business partner gave him and is now desperately trying to cover his ass with falsified documents. Why did he not think that he would be found out? That's just the way malignant narcissists work, I guess. I definitely look into our title insurance standing. I'm a worry wart, so if it was offered to us, I would have taken it. I'll definitely keep you all updated as we meet with our lawyer tomorrow and things progress. Thank you all so much. Keep awesome, Reddit. Now, Overlord1317 says, In most state, Liz Pendens have a special challenge proceeding that allows you to remove the Liz Pendens and recover attorney's fees and costs via an expedited hearing. This is not the same as a regular lawsuit. Typically, the party filing the Liz Pendens must prove they have a viable claim to the property, and the court will set the hearing via the motion calendar versus the trial calendar. Basically, it will be heard much sooner. You should hire an attorney to begin this process ASAP. Please do not expect that any law enforcement agency will do anything to help you or assist in any way. If it turns out the law firm and or client who initiated the Liz Pendens didn't have probable cause, or a variation thereof, states have different terminology. You can sue them for abuse of power, or directly ask for recovery of fees during the Liz Pendens challenge proceeding. Take this seriously. Clouds on title are a big problem if something comes up in your life and you need to refinance or sell, you don't want to be held up for three to six months trying to clear title under the gun. Thank you. This is exactly the kind of information I was hoping to get. We have an appointment with a lawyer on Wednesday. I'll speak to them about what you recommended. And now, update. Someone I've never met claims they own my house. Hi everyone. I can't thank you enough for all the advice on my last post. This is the first update, and I'm hopeful that there will just be one more after this, wrapping everything up so we can just put this behind us. This is what happened since my last post. After the initial letter from the law firm saying they can represent us, we started getting phone calls from other firms, saying they'd been alerted to the Liz Pendens and could also represent us. We were not super happy with this and asked how they got our cell number. They say they subscribe to a service that alerts them when things like the liens, foreclosures, etc. are filed on a property. We hung up. We looked at all our documents from the closing and confirmed that we do indeed have homeowners title insurance. Yay! Our deed is a bargain and sale deed, for those wondering. We also pulled all deeds and mortgages and other documents for our property going back to 1972 online. The last action was when we bought our house. No documents have been filed since. 
I signed up on ACRIS to be alerted to any changes made to the property documents. Thank you to the Redditor who suggested that. I also emailed the DA for my county and the Economic Crimes Bureau head emailed me back to ask for my cell number to follow up with me. I gave it to him, but he hasn't called yet. So maybe that will be in the next and hopefully final update. My husband met with our lawyer this morning and I asked him to speak about all the things that you all suggested in the last post. Prior to the meeting, our lawyer had reached out to the firm who filed the Liz Pendens and actually got a copy of the court transcript where the con man said he owns our property. According to the transcript, he claims he bought it in 2016. Our lawyer called their law firm and basically said, where's the deed? They supposedly hemmed and hawed about it, so we're starting to think they don't actually have it, and never did. They may just be going off the words of a sleazeball who's like, yeah, I totally own that place. I even have a deed for it. No, you can't see it. It's possible that based off this alone, they filed against our property. In addition, it's not like this guy is saying he bought our house last week and the paperwork just hasn't been filed yet. He claims he bought it three years ago and there is still no paperwork filed to attest to this fact. I was able to pull up all records for our home going back nearly 50 years in about 15 minutes online. Our lawyer does not like the way this firm is handling this and basically said to them, you have no grounds for this, take it off. The attorney handling this case at that law firm is out of the office today and tomorrow, but will be calling back our lawyer on Friday. I'm hopeful that it will just be a matter of take the Liz pendants off and okay. I'll update again after the call between the lawyers. I told my husband the number one question is, where is the deed? When we initially spoke with them, they clearly said they had it in hand, which is part of the reason I was freaking out. I honestly just want to be done with this. So getting back to the suing law firm for gross negligence, or whatever term fits the issue, is of no interest to me at this point. If they give us a hard time about removing the Liz pendants, then we'll see. So far, my takeaway from this that I would share with anyone going through something similar is that law firms are made up of people, and just like people can be good and smart and kind, like all of you. They can also be dumb, shifty, and lazy, and not bother to do their due diligence, even though that's like 50% of why they exist in the first place. But I'm not bitter, dot 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 dot. Thank you all so much for your help. I'll update again as things progress and hopefully conclude. And here it is, ladies and gentlemen. Update, someone I've never met claims they own my house. Hey all, as I promised, here is the final barring catastrophe update. Link to the previous related posts below. So it has been a while since my previous update, and I wish I could tell you all that it's because we were involved in a super exciting court battle. No, you're out of order. But the truth is much more annoying and banal, as life tends to be. As we left it in the last post a couple of months ago, our lawyer called the law firm who submitted the action against our property and said, you have no grounds for this, take it off. The paralegal he spoke to said the lawyer handling the case was out that day, but would contact our lawyer soon. They did not. For weeks. Despite everyone bugging them, they were very disinterested in resolving the issue. Color me shocked. In the meantime, we're getting junk mail from law firms and mortgage management companies at least every two to three days, saying they can help us with the issue that we don't have. The notices start to be addressed to us personally instead of this other random guy who said he owned our house. This displeases us. I start keeping a little pile of these letters next to the stairs with copies of our mortgage payments notices from the bank, just in case. This goes on for a while, long enough for my initial <clears throat> anxiety to fade into more of an eh situation. Until yesterday. Our lawyer finally got a response to his email from July, where he outlines everything and attached a preponderance of evidence showing we continue to own our house. And their response is, and I quote, we will remove the action, period. No good afternoon, no sincerely, we will remove the action, 
a shot of an email after weeks of worry. So with a whimper, we got what we wanted. Obviously, we will continue to monitor everything until they actually do what they said they will, but it is a load off my mind. I wish I had something more exciting to tell you, but it seems in the legal world, exciting equals bad. Thank you all for your concern, your advice, and your upvotes. I hope that if any of you face a similar situation, that reading this can help you figure out how to resolve it. Love heart. And with that, we're going straight on to our next one, from Wet Dreams of Dank Memes. That sounds great. New York. Neighbor's kid fell off their trampoline into our yard. To expand on the title, our neighbor's kid had been doing backflips on their trampoline and had landed askew, and it sent the kid flying into our yard where he had hurt his arm. Here's a crude MS Paint diagram of the property lines and houses. Why am I getting addicted to these paintings? Isn't that just beautiful? That's, that's like a modern day Mozart work of art. Anyway, the family of the kid is suing us because their 14 year old had hurt himself in our yard, technically. I don't know how he did it, but he managed to jump high enough to get over the fence and land in our yard. No one on my property was home to witness it. The only reason we found out we're getting sued was when we got served and the mother of the boy had come over and asked for a cash payment for their son's medical bills. How screwed are we? Looking at your diagram and reading your description, he's on a trampoline, flies over a six foot fence on the property line that separates their property from your property and lands in your yard. And they're suing you? Amazing. Is it possible that any of the neighbors has video surveillance cameras that might have captured this? These people are going to be laughed out of any court they try to sue in. People have a name for this. It's called insurance fraud. So for some extra see ya, I would go through the yard with a camera, looking for a divot left after the kid dropped six plus feet onto it. When I didn't find it, I would grab a ladder and see if I could find any suspicious marks in their yard. Then, just out of spite, I'd give their homeowner's insurance company a call and let them know about the unreported trampoline, because that's why this is happening. I was thinking the same thing as the last sentence. Their homeowners probably don't know about the trampoline, which is definitely a big no-no. And now, from wet dreams of dank memes, our update, guys. Thank you to everyone who shared their advice. I contacted my homeowner's insurance, and the representative laughed at the fact that we were getting sued. Long story short, she said not to worry and they would handle it. I contacted a few lawyers in my family, and they said the neighbors had no bounds to sue, since the trampolines are apparently illegal in my town. Turns out that the neighbors do not own the house, and that they rent it. The owner and landlord of that house was miffed, since he is the one who will have to pay the fines for the trampoline. Turns out that the renters don't have renters insurance, which is why they asked for a cash payment from me. Last I heard was that the landlord gave them a 30 day notice. As for me, I'm buying exterior cameras, so this doesn't happen anymore. That sounds like a jolly good idea. And as for us, we're on to the next story by Holy Bananas 4. Sold townhouse. A year later, aircon goes out. New owner wants us to pay. North Carolina, USA. So we sold a townhouse September 2016. The townhouse is a two unit system. We had just replaced one unit, but disclosed the state and age of the aging unit. We even paid to have it serviced before putting it on the market. Today, November 21, 2018, we receive a letter stating that the new owners had to replace the older AC unit. They requested that we pay half of the amount. They even state that they have a lawyer. There is an enclosed statement from the company that put in the AC unit stating that the compression coil was rusted and that it should have been caught beforehand, and that it had no Freon. Do they even have a case? Do we get a lawyer? I genuinely don't know where to begin. Probably they have no case, but if you get sued, you will need to respond, otherwise they might win by default. Thank you. They have a lawyer, but they're the ones contacting you directly asking you to pay? Nah. Yeah. After freaking out a little bit, my husband and I talked it through and came to the same conclusion that you did. They should be taking this up with the person they paid to inspect the home, not you. 
The only way you could be held liable is if they could prove you knew this at the time of sale and didn't disclose it. A real estate home inspector can insert a clause in his contract that limits his liability to the cost of the inspection. In other words, if he misses a problem, the most he can pay is the return of his fee. The second reason involves the effect of the language, known as exculpatory clause. Like it was stated, I would seize any contact with them if and when you were contacted by an attorney. But I couldn't see one taking the case. And now, on to the update by Holly Bananas 4. I know only a handful of people will read this, but I figured why not do an update. So we were sued via small claims court for half the amount of the AC unit. The case, predictably, was dismissed, as we didn't misrepresent the condition of the 14-year-old unit. What was interesting is that he genuinely thought that we owed him the money. Almost to the point of self-righteousness. The way he talked about us, what he supposedly was told with nothing evidentiary to back up his claims, additionally stating that his lawyer said that his case was strong. His lawyer didn't manage to show up to court, but you know, Still very strong case, you know? It's just, that's just how it goes. Oh well, it's over. It's a very interesting way, you know, you have a great case, but uh, I'll see you in the next court case, buddy. Anyway, apparent throwaway 79. I found out I had a child when CPS contacted me because her mother was losing custody. Now what? MD. Sorry for the crappy title. To make a long story short, I was a junkie, and as a result, did a lot of dumb, questionable things. I have been clean for 11 years now. About a week and a half ago, I was contacted by Child Protective Services, who asked if I knew Mary Smith, a woman with who I had a relationship when I was on drugs. I said yes, and was informed that she had a child, Emma last name, who had been taken from the home, and I was named as her father. With no contactable family, she could come to me or otherwise go to foster care. It was relayed to me that I was listed as the child's father on her legal documents as well. To cut some bullcrap from the middle here, I'll just skip to the fact that I did accept emergency custody of the child, and I do actually pretty strongly believe that I'm her biological father for a number of reasons. But I feel like at this point, the caseworkers have been unhelpful and are basically like for all intents and purposes, you're her legal father, bye! And not answering my questions, you know? Emma apparently knew I existed and was told through her life that I was her father, but her mother said she had no way of contacting me, which I guess is technically true. So my questions are one, how was I listed on the birth certificate, legal records, school records, etc., and literally never informed ever at any point? How is this possible? 2. The caseworker said that because I'm on the birth certificate, and the undertone here was unless you have an identical twin somewhere that is 100% your child, you know? There is no need to take a DNA test. Is there any benefit to doing so? 3. This one I may have to consult with a lawyer on, but if I'm her father, am I then entitled to child support? Or the foster care stipend? That sounds terrible, but I don't have make a lot of money, and I'm stressed because there's times I feel like I'm not sure if I'm going to have enough for myself, even working full time. And I need to be able to provide for a kid now, too. It's not about the money, 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 but it's a little bit about the money, you know? Like Kanye said, having money's not everything, not having it is. See if you can apply for TANF in your state. Maybe Medicaid for your daughter. SNAP benefits. You aren't a foster care provider. You would need to take all the classes, and even then you're a parent. You can't do foster care for your own kid. See if you can do Section 8 or CCAP assistance. There's a lot of programs out there. It actually wouldn't hurt to get a foster license anyway, because he might qualify for assistance through Child Protective Services. Plus, you learn a lot more about what kids go through. Yes, get a DNA test. You're on the birth certificate because mum listed you as the father. Child support maybe, but if mum has no job or money, it is semi-pointless. Blood from a stone and all of that. DNA test now. I would go after child support in the event that mum gets her life straightened out or comes into some money someday. Tax refund, whatever. 
In that case, income can be garnished for back support, no? Yes, sign up for child support even if it arrives so late that it can be used to buy gifts for grandchildren. That's a really good point actually, I think, I think that is great advice. And now onto the update. Nearly three months later, about the kid I didn't know existed for 10 years. It's been almost three months now, and I thought I'd come in real quick to give an update. Overall, the kid and I are doing great. I really expected the adjustment period to suck, but I feel like maybe this poor kid really needed some structure and stability and totally glommed onto that. I try to just give her as much of my love, patience, structure, and stability that I can give. I've been learning a lot about attachment, trauma, and everything. It's been overwhelming, but every night, no matter how exhausted I am, I get into bed and I thank God for her. I wouldn't trade her for anything in this world. I tell her every night she's my favorite thing. Legally, things are kind of boring. I did the DNA test, unsurprisingly, got the result that she's mine biologically. The emergency order is still in place. Her mom is still in jail. She was offered the option of going to rehab and refused. She'll be in jail for at least a few more months. And after she's out, we will be making a parenting plan for visits with help from the social worker. Realistically, I think she'll die before she gets clean. That sounds like a horrible thing to say, but it is how it is. It's been a wild ride, it's not easy, but it's joyful and it's really changed my life and made me want to be better in a lot of ways. Well, I guess there's sunshine at the end of the rainbow, guys. Yikes. And our next post is by Not a Criminal 18. Refused DNA test, California. So I work at a day program for disabled adults and teenagers. One of our members became pregnant, which is really terrible because she is a mentally disabled person who can't consent. Since then, all of the employees at my job have been questioned and all of the male employees have been asked to voluntarily provide DNA samples. I wouldn't do it, and now I'm being treated like a criminal. Supervisors have been following me around, and I've been written up twice for little things that people do all the time. I think they are trying to force me out. I don't want to lose my job, but I especially don't want people thinking I'm an abuser. I am a dietary aide, so I don't even interact with members much. I didn't do anything wrong, but am I being targeted? What should I do? Absent a contract. It would not be illegal to fire you under a suspicion of raping a disabled person. They do not have credible evidence to fire you. They cannot force you to take a DNA test, but they do not have to continue to employ you. If you are a member of a union, you can seek their help. Otherwise, you can submit the test or wait to be fired and apply for unemployment when you are. Edit because it comes up. The reason they cannot require a DNA test is from the GINA law. If OP wants after he gets fired, he could pursue this with EEOC. However, I disagree that it's so clear cut that OP would win millions, as has been suggested to him on the BLA thread. If OP is the guilty party, he certainly shouldn't volunteer his DNA and should be concerned about police involvement, which could come up regardless of what the employer wants if the woman's OB or the hospital where she gives birth reports it. That's a bold statement to make when GINA specifically makes it illegal to make hiring and firing decisions based on DNA. My question is, why would they be collecting DNA prior to birth? I suppose it is possible to do a paternity test on a fetus, but it would be an extremely risky procedure. Is the employer asking him to submit this or is it a social services? This makes no sense. It's not that risky. Some advances in the last five to 10 years have made it possible with just a blood test from the pregnant person. This is one for an Australian example. And someone else says, not one person has said this. It's not the employer's place to be requesting DNA samples from their employee. If a crime was committed, shouldn't the police be the ones making this request? In which place you would be all saying, rightfully lawyer up, which he should do anyway. I would in no way, shape, or form submit to any demand for a DNA test from an employer that didn't require security clearance as part of that job, and neither should OP. Oh my god, this just gets worse in the comments, no way! Have you considered submitting to the DNA test? 
If someone comes at me with a warrant, I would, but I'm not going to give a DNA sample just because they ask, you know? Who knows what they do with the sample? Test you for raping a mentally disabled girl? How would I know that my DNA is used only for this particular case? Would I be entered into some sort of database? If the cops have my DNA on file, could it be used to frame me if I pee off the wrong person? These are the kinds of questions I have. Oh my god, what has this turned into? This is insane. Anyway guys, here's the update. World's fastest update, refuse DNA test. While I was getting my butt handed to me in this post, a co-worker confessed to the assault. From what I hear, the DNA tests were just a threat to put pressure on this dude, who they suspected. I don't think they actually took anyone's DNA. Many people pointed out that I sounded sketchy in my original post. That was probably true, I'm a recovering addict, three years clean and sober, and I did a lot of crazy stuff in my past. Not raping anyone, but junky crap like breaking and entering, squatting, getting in fights, etc. I didn't know you could get a paternity test for an unborn baby, so I thought that they were just going to put my DNA in a database, and maybe things I never got caught for would come up. If I knew I was just being tested against a baby, I would have said sure. I want to say that because of my past, I'm a squeaky clean employee. I've never so much as swiped a snack from the pantry or an Advil from the med cart. We're not supposed to ever be alone with members, and I never am. Even if I'm just dropping off a tray in someone's room, or if a member has work detail in the kitchen. I guess I was acting paranoid because I was ticked at being suspected when I've tried so hard to be straight, and that ended up making me seem more suspicious. Hopefully now the guy who did it was arrested, things can go back to normal. I hope the woman who was taken advantage of is doing okay. She's not here anymore, and I don't know what is happening. Sorry for the novel, but I wanted to let everyone know what was going on. Edit, I think the reason everyone was so mad at me in the original post was because I was acting like I was the victim. Even though obviously that was not the case, that is some of the addict mentality that I'm still working on with my sponsor. Indianapolis. Four days ago, I accidentally almost got into the wrong car, causing the elderly woman inside the car to try to flee, and she fell. Today I was told I would be sued if I didn't pay ambulance and ER bills. Four days ago, Monday the 4th of the 11th, I was parked in a very full parking lot and returned to my car in a distracted state. I didn't realize that I had parked next to a car that was identical to mine. I opened the unlocked driver's side door and put my leg in, but immediately withdrew my leg because I heard someone inhale sharply and then heard the passenger side door open. Obviously this wasn't my car, so I began apologizing, and as I was shutting the door, I could see an elderly woman struggling to get out of the car. I was still apologizing when she fell out of the car. I went around quickly and asked if she was alright. Did she need me to call an ambulance? Did she need me to go find whoever she was waiting for, etc? She told me I didn't need to call an ambulance, but asked if I would stay with her until her daughter came back. She didn't know which store her daughter was in and didn't have her number memorized. I helped her back into the passenger's seat. She had an abrasion on her right palm, which I offered to disinfect since I keep a first aid kit in my car. She accepted and said that she wasn't hurt anywhere else, just shaken up. She asked me for water and I gave her a bottle from my car. She told me she was a diabetic and that her blood sugar was low and that she didn't have her insulin with her, so I offered her a banana. We spent about five or so minutes together before her daughter came running up. We explained to her what had happened and the daughter was pissed at me. Rightfully so, since I did scare her mother and she fell. I offered again to call an ambulance to make sure she was alright, and they both refused. I suggested they take her to the doctor as soon as possible to make sure that she didn't injure anything from the fall. I apologized again and went home. This morning, the mother and daughter showed up on my front porch. I think they were trying to intimidate me since the husband stood there the entire time with his arms crossed, and with what I assume was supposed to be a scary look on his face. The elderly woman and I only exchanged first names so I don't know how they found out who I am or where I lived. I asked and they said they had their ways. The daughter told me she ended up calling an ambulance because her mother began to have a panic attack before they left the parking lot. 
I asked if she was okay, and she told me that wasn't any of my business. She said they were going to sue me if I didn't pay the ER bill and the ambulance bill. They said they wanted $3,500. I asked if her mother had insurance, and was again told that it wasn't my business. I asked to see the bills because I obviously have my doubts that they said they didn't have them with them. I said, so you expect me to just hand you $3,500? And that pissed them both off. I told them to get off my property and that I would call the police if they refused or came back. I told them to have their lawyer contact me. They both called me a bitch and left. I've included every detail I can think of, so my question is, could they really sue me? I understand you can basically sue anyone for anything, but am I legally responsible to pay these medical bills if they do in fact exist? Thanks in advance, I'm on mobile, so I apologize for any formatting errors. Edit, thank you to those who responded. I'm 31, but often get mistaken for someone much younger. The daughter and her husband are, or look to be, in their mid to late 40s. I suspect they may just have seen what they think to be a young and naive woman that may be dumb and scared enough to pay them. I do have a home security system, I can also defend myself should my home security system fail. Thank you to those voicing concern for my safety. I don't know much about diabetes, the woman told me she was lightheaded and that she had diabetes, and that her blood sugar was low. She asked if I had any food and I gave her the banana in my purse. She specifically mentioned not having her insulin with her. And there's not really much to this, there's no update, but there is a pretty long comment here that says, You should probably contact the police about their contact with you, and let them know that you have instructed that they are trespassing if they are on your property. Edit, this will make it easier for the police to cite them, rather than just warn them if it happens again, and you call the police. Discuss with the police the fact that you asked how they found your address, and that they said they have their ways. Also discuss that you felt like they were trying to threaten and intimidate you with their presence. It's likely that they either followed you home, or they somehow took some paperwork from you with your address. Or, they may have contact with someone in the police department, and they gave them your license plate and got your address this way. This is at best a violation of department policy, and very likely a crime. The police department will be able to make the legal slash improper query. The police will likely not tell you the result of the investigation, but if you are calm but firm about them taking the threat and trespass warning seriously, it's likely that they will investigate. Especially if one of the two of them who you have trespassed is an officer or an employee of the police department. If you are sued, you need to tell your attorney that you reported this to the police, and that they may have a report slash investigation. Can they try? Sure. Will they be successful? Highly doubt it. Sounds like the reason the old woman fell is because of her low blood sugar. An abrasion to the palm from the actual fall isn't an injury that warrants an ambulance ride or a hospital trip. And they've pulled this $3,500 figure out of their asses because literally no one would have hospital or ambulance billing four days after an accident. If they show up at your house again, call the police. Neighbor damaged their car pulling into my driveway want us to pay for repairs, Ontario, Canada. Neighbors across the street, entire family, uses our driveway to pull into before backing into their own driveway. We have asked them to stop, but they ignore us. They say there is no city bylaw against it, which I believe is correct. In the past, they have damaged our lawn, broken our garbage can, and damaged our recycling slash compost bins. Today was garbage day and I put out some broken shelves at the end of our driveway with a garbage can and other bins to make it easier for the garbage workers to reach, because of the snowbanks. About an hour ago, angry neighbours show up at our door and say that we need to keep our driveway clear at all times, and the trash there damaged their car when they pulled in. He wanted to know where they should send their car for repairs since we would be paying. To say I am angry is an understatement. He claimed the first few feet of our driveway is public property controlled by the city, and since it wasn't kept clean and damaged his car, we need to pay. I asked him to leave our property before I called the police. He told me to go ahead. At that point, I closed the door and locked it. Can I really be held liable for having an idiotic neighbor? 
Is my best course of action to just ignore him until I get served with legal papers, or should I be proactive and get a lawyer myself? Look mate, Neighbor is a complete idiot. In the first place, in Ontario, the driver of the vehicle who collides with stationary objects is 100% at fault. Additionally, he is a criminally liable idiot. In fact, there is an Ontario law against it. It's called the Trespass to Property Act. Having asked the neighbor not to trespass on your property, you have satisfied the notice provision. Thereafter, each time the neighbor uses your driveway is an offense for which they can be arrested and charged, and the proof lies on them that they have a right to your driveway. Your statement that you orally notified them to cease is sufficient to defeat any claims they have to the contrary. Edit, assuming you possess the property to the edge of the roadway, which is not unusual, easement or not, you would still be the person occupying the property. If the neighbor threatens to call the police, you could dial the number for them, then go inside and make popcorn, print the statuette, and ask the responding officers to explain it to your neighbor. Don't forget the damages part. Once there is damage to the property, the recycling bins, etc., there is a case. The classic four are duties owed, breach of duty, negligence, damages. The hostile neighbor hit all four. In most courts, that is sufficient to pursue recovery against the jerks. And most Canadian homes in most municipalities have a municipally owned strip in front of them that is considered part of the roadway. On my street, it varies from about 20 feet down to a few inches in front of our house. Many people use this for parking in front of their own homes, and it is considered extremely rude to use a neighbors without permission. Some places allow only a certain width of drive over this strip. Homeowners must maintain it, and in my city cannot landscape, add trees, or retaining walls without permits. And now, on to our update. Neighbor damaged their car pulling into my driveway, wants us to pay for repairs. It's been about a week since the issue came up, and I thought I would post an update. I ended up going to speak with them the following day to tell them about the trespass. I also gave them a letter stating the same thing. It's just something I made up based on suggestions here and what I found on the internet. They seemed a little surprised and didn't say much other than I should expect to hear from their attorney. So far, we haven't heard from anyone lawyer-wise. For a short time, I felt like the problem was resolved as nobody used our driveway. This all changed yesterday, Friday exactly a week since the incident when my neighbor pulled into my driveway as I was clearing ice from it. He smiled, waved, and reversed into his driveway. I did manage to take a photo as I shook my head no at him. They used our driveway at least two other times in the evening after dark that we know about. I called the non-emergency police number this morning to report the trespassing, and the call taker told me someone would contact us soon. At this point, I think I would be surprised if the police did anything based on what I'll mention later in my text. I have also pursued this in two other ways. First, the bylaw folks did get back in touch with me to tell me that there has been no bylaw stating others couldn't use my driveway. They also said that I'm well within my rights to put anything I want in my driveway anywhere, as long as it's not a permanent structure. I also learned that blocking my driveway from the street is not permitted and that anything within 1.5 meters on either side of the driveway is considered blocking. Bylaw said that the damage to the car is a civil matter and has nothing to do with them. Not surprised there. Lastly, I tried to find out if I own the driveway all the way to the road. This has been an exercise in frustration to be honest. Right now, the only thing I know for sure is the following. City right of way. This term refers to the city-owned portion of a piece of land. It is very often wider than the road and sidewalks that may abut your property and can extend to a considerable extent onto your property. The city maintains a right-of-way wider than the width of the road in the event that a road widening becomes necessary at some point in the future. Notwithstanding this, a property owner is still responsible for maintaining the city-owned portion of their land, with respect to matters such as grass cutting and snow clearance. The exact extent of the city's right-of-way can be determined through a plan of survey. This leads me to believe that the city does own a piece of the driveway, but I don't know how much and if this means my neighbor can use it. The fact that they began using it a week after my visit leads me to believe that they found out that they are free to use it. 
At this point, we are trying to decide if we drop it or go all in and hire our own attorney. Someone from the planning department of the city is going to be calling us back next week, at least I hope. Thanks to everyone for all the great advice, cheers. And now, final update. I figured I owed you all one final update. Idiot Neighbor will now forever be known as Jerk Neighbor. We received a letter from a law firm representing them. The letter basically says we put obstructions in the driveway when we knew they used it on a daily basis. They are now willing to settle for the cost of repairs plus attorney costs. I don't know if <laughs> they are permitted here or not, but screw them. I may not be able to block them using our driveway, see below, but I won't be paying them anything ever. We have heard back from the city police and they won't do anything unless we are threatened. A wave does not constitute a threat, so they want no part of this. I also got a copy of the property map, and the city owns more than half the distance between the house and the road. Give or take, you know, the city portion is about a normal car length. We are granted a right of way. Technically, Jerk Neighbor has no right to use it, but nothing will be done by the city to block this, and there is no bylaw against it. Lastly, we cannot trespass people on the city's portion of our driveway. I have a feeling that Jerk Neighbor was made aware of this sometime around when they started using our driveway again. I have hired a lawyer. He has asked that I no longer post to social media, so with that said, I'm out. And our next post. I believe my HIPAA rights were violated when my surgeon's scheduler told my parents that I was pregnant. I never thought about the situation like this, but I had people point out that my rights may have been violated, and I'm not sure what steps to take next, and I'll try to explain the situation the best I can. I am 24 and live in the USA, and I'm on birth control, but it failed. I didn't realize that I was pregnant until I went to the hospital for something unrelated and found out I needed surgery for something and that I was pregnant on the same day. I quickly looked into abortion options, but haven't been able to go through with it because I haven't had the fundings, but I'm trying to figure out now so I can get the surgery and be healthy again. I went for my surgical consultation, and the doctor said he would feel much safer waiting for me to terminate before performing the surgery, but I would have to schedule the surgery through his assistant A. A called me shortly after the surgical consultation and pressed me the entire phone call to keep the baby, but when I told her I was planning on going through with the termination, wouldn't schedule my appointments until I had gone through with it. So I've had to put the appointment off and wait until then, which is fine but my parents are in on why I need the surgery and I've had to come up with excuses as to why I can't schedule it yet, because I don't want them to try to pressure me not to terminate. Fast forward to last Tuesday, and I get a text from my dad that says something to the effect of, we know why you haven't scheduled the appointment and we're very disappointed in you. It turns out that they called the office and the assistant disclosed my pregnancy to my parents, and it's causing me a great deal of emotional turmoil because my parents have been acting super weird around me and now I'm doubly stressed about the situation. I never gave her or anyone else permission to disclose my medical status to anyone, and I feel like my rights as a patient have been violated. I guess my question would be, do I have grounds for legal recourse? What would my next steps be and what should I do from here? Edit, fixed a word because I don't proofread. Edit, edit, Thank you so much for everyone's kind words. This has helped me immensely, and I appreciate all of the advice that I've gotten and am continuing to get. I'm so grateful that I have been met with nothing but kind words and thoughts. It sounds like you've filed a complaint, so it should be investigated. That's about all you can do as federal law is concerned. Unfortunately, only the government can bring an action under HIPAA. However, Maryland has its own Medical Privacy Act, that does allow for private action. You would have to show actual damages, which can sometimes include things like harassment or embarrassment. It is probably worth your time to reach out to an attorney who specializes in the MCMRA. Oh, thank you. I told my therapist about all of this, so I'm sure she'd be willing to back me up as far as claims of emotional distress. No problem. Hope that you were able to find someone to help you. Best of luck with the surgery, and sorry that their breach of privacy is adding stress to what I'm sure was an already stressful enough situation. Thank you so much. Have a great week. And our final one, update. I'm making progress with HIPAA, but not a lot and things have been unduly stressful. 
Check out my account if you want to keep up to date on my situation, but I have some updates. Doing a TLDR at the bottom. Good news. I am in contact with a lawyer currently. He's taking my case pro bono because I couldn't afford to pay him, but we're still contact in the office, my parents in the office, and their HIPAA officer. And things are moving slowly because there is a lot of information that needs to be gathered and collected, but we're getting there slowly. I sold some of my things and contacted abortion assistance programs and got about $800 towards my procedure and scheduled it. It's nowhere near where I need to be, but it's there. Bad news, my appointment is tomorrow, and I'm still short over $1,000 and will probably have to reschedule. My partner can't take me tomorrow regardless, because he has something out of state which he has to go to. My mental and physical health feels like it's been declining, and I'm trying to hang in there, but it's definitely difficult and isolating because of the shame I feel surrounding this. Thought you guys deserved some sort of update on this situation. I think my co-worker's disabled son is stalking me. What options do I have? This is in Oklahoma. So I'm a high school teacher. I work in a very rural, very small school, and have been here for 15 years. Dan, my across the hall mate, has been here eight. His son Leo has some serious developmental issues, and attended the school until he graduated three years ago. Leo was somewhat of a legend at the school. Since Dan was the football coach, Leo would serve at the manager at the games and the kids treated him well. Leo would often visit his dad's classroom before and after school and Dad got to know him as well. Leo became somewhat independent after graduation and is able to hold down a very basic part-time job that he can ride his bike to from his home. This past summer, Dan and his wife went on a three-week vacation for their anniversary. They asked me if I would be a source of support for Leo while they were away. While Leo was okay to stay by himself, he cannot drive. So I would take him to get groceries and drive him to work if it was raining. I also checked in on him every day with a text or a call. The last day I was to be in this role, Leo sent me a very inappropriate text that included a photo of his penis. I told Leo that was inappropriate and that I would be telling his father. I showed Dan the text and he claimed that Leo's phone must have been hacked or played with while Leo was at work. I didn't believe that explanation, but I accepted it and moved on. The next day, my phone started blowing up with texts from Leo, more than 100 inside four hours, asking me if he could hold on to me and take me for a ride on his four-wheeler and kiss me gently. I forwarded the text to Dan and did not respond to Leo. Dan came to my house the next day and said that Leo was not sending those texts. He said he was going to take the phone and see what happens. Then I started getting texts through some unknown number that were the same in tone and writing. A selfie of Leo nude was also sent. I called Dan, thinking this might be something happening at Leo's job or something. This didn't stop. I was getting hundreds of texts a day from different numbers. As soon as I blocked one, another popped up. I went down to the store where Leo worked and spoke with the manager. I taught all of his children. He told me that Leo had been spending a lot of time on a co-worker's phone, and he had already talked to Dan about it two weeks ago. So Dan knew this was happening and did nothing. I changed my number, then school started, and everyone was sent contact information for all teachers. This included my new number. Dan, being in my department and a member of the faculty, got this information. The next thing I know, I'm getting crazy texts again. I said something to Dan at work. Dan said Leo was harmless, and I should just respond to him because he liked me, and the more I avoided him, the more miserable it makes Leo. Dan even said those days that my number stopped working, Leo became very angry, and Dan had to give him medication. Last night, when I got home from work, my kids told me that Leo had come by looking for me. I was surprised that he had ridden his bike all the way out here. The kids said he arrived in a car, but not Dan's car. My son guessed it was an Uber. I don't want to sound like a paranoid nut, but this whole thing is unsettling. Am I being stalked? Am I being unsympathetic to Leo's problems? Is it wrong of me to expect Dan to manage his son's problems? What do I do next? I'm not going anywhere, and I doubt Dan is, so we will be across the hallmates for another 10 years. 
I initially posted this to relationships, but was told this was a better place for it. Thank you in advance for any suggestions. You need to contact the police and get them to tell him to leave you alone. You also need to contact a superior at work since he likely got your number through your work. Screw Dan's feelings. It will be awkward, but Leo is escalating his behavior and I assume Dan is still listed as a guardian. Intellectual disability is not an excuse for his behavior. Agreed, though I might tell your superiors first just in case before going to the police so this doesn't blow up in your face. Make sure you've kept receipts and screenshots of his messages to you, and also messages to Dan to confirm that you have asked for his help in the matter and that he refused. This is harassment, and if he cannot control himself in this way, it's quite possible he could turn violent. I would be quick to deal with this if he's already showing up at your house. Look, your safety needs to be your number one priority. You've tried talking to Dan and had your concerns dismissed, so I think it's time to escalate. Do you have anyone else in the school you can talk about this to? Talk to someone at the school administration and let them know that you plan to go to the police about the harassment, because Dan hasn't done anything about it. If you go straight to the police, Dan will likely speak to your colleagues and administrators and paint you in a bad light, as if you were trying to get Leo arrested for a harmless crush. Follow up the conversation with an email summarizing it so there's also a paper trail. And I couldn't find an official like link to the update, but I did find an update uh, that was posted, I think, the next day. Original poster here. I appreciate all of the PMs and advice I have been given. I'm going to go to the Sheriff's Department on Monday, accompanied by an attorney that I spoke with on Friday afternoon. The Sheriff's sons all played football with Dan as their coach. So I'm hoping to speak with one of the newer deputies. I bought a doorbell camera and installed it today. Someone asked how old Leo is. He is 21. I have considered the possibility that Leo's co-workers are either pranking him or putting him up to this, but I don't believe that is the case here. Leo had to get my new number and then continue the harassment with it. My son and a former student who was very tech savvy told me the reason the numbers keep changing is because the co-worker or Leo are using a spoofing app. All of this said, many people don't understand small town politics. I don't mean suburbia, I mean 100 miles out of nowhere and a population of less than 400 within our town. Dan is the football coach of the county high school. He's somewhat of a local celebrity. This whole thing will likely blow up with me being painted as the unsympathetic to special people's needs, and I have steeled myself for that. And they don't have any updates for us after that one, it's kind of sad. That's our final update, there is nothing else that I can find unfortunately, and I hope that OP goes okay, but we all know what happens in small country towns like that. Uh, you know, if that person has the, the town on their side, it's not going to go well for OP. I think it's just the way of the land. You guys tell me your stories of little country towns, what's your perspective on this one? And our next post. I allowed my 17 year old sister to move in with me, CT to New York. Dad is threatening me with kidnapping charges in New York. Sorry for the huge post. Last year, in April of 2017, my sister, then 17 and living in Connecticut with our mother, dropped out of high school and came to live with me. I lived in New York State, Albany area. My mother is disabled by mental illness, and in her condition, was neglecting my sister and my adult brother that lived there, who is disabled with autism, she was physically abusive towards both of them. According to the custody agreement, in my mother and father's divorce in 2006, it was dad that was supposed to be the custodial parent, and my mum was supposed to be paying him child support and getting weekend visitation. My sister lived with my dad and his then girlfriend, now wife for about three years, and then he sent her to live with mum. However, mum never got the support order changed, but worked out an agreement with dad. She got to keep the social security income money that was my sister's benefit, instead of it being forwarded to dad for support, and he kept her on his health insurance. When my sister came to live with me last year, mum told me she would send the benefit money on to me for taking care of my sister. She didn't. Dad kept her on his health insurance, but refused to pay anything towards her online high school course, and when asked, saying he didn't have any money to spare. So I'm paying it because she needs a high school education, and it's only $50 a month. 
This year my sister turned 18, and has almost finished her online high courses, and has started looking for a job, but is considering trade school, and I am so proud of her. She will be staying with me until she can afford to move out. My wife and I have agreed to that and have no problem with that. In New York, child support can be received up to age 21. So I filed a petition for child support for mum and dad through New York State, and the county court here sent out notices for them to appear for a court date. Dad received his yesterday and called me up, asked me why I was doing this to him, told me I need to drop the case because it's going to ruin him financially and that technically what you did was kidnapping because nobody asked him permission when my sister was moving from Connecticut to New York to live with me when the court order still says she was supposed to live with him, but that he didn't want to go down that route because it's low, but that it's low of me to bring him to court about child support. So my question is, do I need to worry about being arrested for kidnapping? Would I be better off dropping the child support case? So, you don't need to be worried about being arrested for kidnapping, because you never kidnapped her. You looked after your sister and went above and beyond for her. Your dad, quite frankly, is unsurprisingly an idiot. Imagine being a police officer and getting called to a kidnapping charge where the girl is happy to be there, was given permission by the current parent, is now 18 years of age, and was given an opportunity to get an education. The kidnapper is a family member who allows her to come and go as she pleases, and the complainant is a deadbeat dad, and said father said he would overlook said charge for financial gain. Be proud of what you have done and who you are as a person. Thank you for the reassurance and the kind words. So, extortion? The police aren't going to get involved in a kidnapping where the victim was a consenting 17 year old at the time, and neither parent thought to report it until after she reached the age of majority, or maturity, come on mate. The threat is largely empty. If by some miracle the police do want to talk to you about this, do not respond with an attorney, and tell them, frankly but politely, that you are not going to speak with them without one. But otherwise, relax. Personally, I would overlook your father's threats and ignore them, but however you choose to proceed, there is no point in engaging with them. The rest of this will be worked out in the hearing about support. This is also what I was thinking, but I'm prone to anxiety and think I just needed to hear it from other people that are not emotionally involved in the issues themselves. Thank you for the answer. Adding on to the previous poster, the only way the police would stay involved is if you pressed charges for extortion, which would be well deserved, although I'd suggest just cutting that jerk out of your guys' lives altogether. I don't plan on pressing charges. I was really hoping it wouldn't get nasty, but here we are. I hate how money issues turn family members against each other. I think he feels I'm being vindictive because my sister hasn't had a good childhood. While I am angry about how my sister was treated by our parents, I'm not doing this for revenge. I am just trying to make sure my sister can get what she needs. And now, update to that last story. So I had my day in court for the child support hearing. Dad showed up in court instead of using the option of conference call like my mother did. My sister, let's call her Valerie, wanted to sit in the courtroom in case the judge had any questions of her in particular. He didn't, but I'm proud of how brave my sister is for going to court when she didn't have to. Because I could feel my heart beating in my throat the entire time. The judge started out by saying he was unsure if a support order could be issued today, given that Valerie is 18 and in Connecticut would be ineligible, but in New York would be eligible until 21, but then began asking some some questions. Dad did a lot of talking at first, mostly saying how he had a court order that gave him full custody of Valerie and that mum was supposed to be paying child support. Then he said how Valerie dropped out of high school and left the state to live with me without telling him or getting his permission and how he didn't know for a month after the fact. He complained that mum never speaks to him about anything, that I make no effort to have a relationship with him and that Valerie doesn't either. Boo hoo, we're all ganging up on him and he doesn't know what he did to deserve it, etc. Sure enough, as a few of you kind folks mentioned, the judge asked him, why didn't you know where she was for a month if she was supposed to be in your custody? He then says she was staying with her mother at the time, 
but that she would have had a place to stay with him and still does have a place to stay with him if she had asked. At that point, sick of hearing him play the victim, I piped up and asked him as calmly as I possibly could, why didn't she have a place with you nine years ago when you dropped her off at mum's house? Didn't tell her you weren't coming back for her and then got rid of all her belongings. My mother on the phone confirmed what happened and said that she asked me if I could take in my sister because of my brother's violent behavior in early 2017. Valerie was 17 at the time that she moved to New York State and is still attending high school to earn her diploma, which is better late than never. And I've been her sole source of support ever since. The judge then reviewed the guidelines for monetary support. My mother, being disabled and on social security, was to pay no more than $50 per month for support. Dad was to pay no more than 17% of his income, which translated roughly to $800 per month. The judge asked me what amount I was looking for. My answer was that I just wanted some to help with the groceries and her medical bills. So I asked for a total of $250 from dad and the max $50 from mum. Dad then tried to haggle me down to 200 per month because he just bought a house last year. Should have seen the look on the judge's face. The judge reminded him that the guidelines recommended $800 a month and I held firm on 250. Dad sighed and said that he'll give up smoking to afford it. This is supposed to make me feel bad? The judge made the order for support, effective until age 21, and I never get in trouble for allegedly kidnapping my sister. Thank you to everyone that gave me encouragement to see this through and to not fall for my dad's intimidation tactics. And our next post, US citizen cousin, 16 female, is abroad and under heavy pressure to get married by parents. She asked for my help. My cousin is 16 years old. I am 22 and live in Massachusetts. She was born in Massachusetts to non-citizen parents and has not been in the US since she was one years old but she was born in the US, so she is a US citizen, but she doesn't speak any English. She currently lives in Pakistan and told me that she is under heavy pressure to get married to someone that is picked by her parents. She asked me to help her somehow get out of that situation and if possible, come to the US. She doesn't have a passport or a US birth certificate. I know there is one, but she doesn't have it herself. Either her parents destroyed it or they have it. She lives in a rural area is generally heavily monitored and has a very limited internet access. She also can't go to the embassy, which is in Islamabad. She lives in the Sindh province. Who do I contact here to get her the help that she needs? Is there a hope that she can come here? I was able to get my wife out of Pakistan when her parents convinced her to visit and then essentially kept her there. I contacted the US embassy in Islamabad to accomplish this. They were able to convince her parents to bring her to the embassy to handle passport issues. Once she was there, they separated her from her family and put her on a plane the next day. The only thing is, I had to buy the plane ticket for her. They normally do not have the funds. Here is the email address for the US embassy that I had to contact with. Very nice. So help her get her birth certificate. Contact the Bureau of Vital Statistics for the state she was born in and see what it will take to get her birth certificate. Once she has that, things will be a lot easier when dealing with the US government. If she was born in mass, you can order her birth certificate through Vital Check online and have it expedited. Very nice. Do you have the means to travel to Pakistan under the guise of a family visit and then escort her to the embassy? If you were male, you would probably be able to go to places without anyone suspecting anything. I know two plane tickets would be quite expensive. Do you know any family or friends who would be willing to do that? No, I don't think so. I am also female and I have never been to Pakistan or outside of the US. I really don't know the country or area. Well, now it's time for the update. Let's see what happens. Update, we helped her and she's here. So thank you for helping and pointing me in the right direction. My sister and I contacted the state department, the embassy and the consulate in Karachi. They were able to verify that she exists and that she is a US citizen. We told them of what's happening to her and they were quite helpful in telling us what to do and being ready to help her as soon as possible. The challenge was getting her into the consulate in Karachi, but she actually got herself there, two weeks of planning, where they gave her travel documents to be able to come to the US. 
we bought tickets for her to go from Karachi to Doha, and from then to Boston, where we picked her up from the airport. By the time her parents realized what's what, she was on the Doha to Boston flight. Her parents tried to apply for a visa to come to the US, but their visa applications were refused. I'm not aware if the people at the embassy who refused it actually knew about my cousin's situation or not, but we are glad that they weren't able to come here. She currently lives with me and my sister, and my sister has been granted guardianship over her. Her priority is to learn English. Her parents will still try to somewhat make her return, but we've closed down the lines of communication, and hopefully her life from now on will be stress-free. And now, on to our next post. Accidentally drink and dashed yesterday. Would it be stupid for me to go back today and pay the tab? EU. So there is this bar me and my boyfriend semi-regularly go to. Recently, they changed the way they serve drinks. You used to have to go to the counter, order, they gave you your drink and you paid then and there. Done. Now they have a server who goes to your table and it all works like a restaurant. Except yesterday we kind of forgot that when we finished our drinks, a cocktail and a beer, about four bucks all in all, and left. This morning it kind of occurred to my boyfriend that we forgot to pay. I know morally going back and paying is the right choice, but what if they won't take the money and instead want to get the cops involved? Because right now they don't have any identifying information of us aside from descriptions. But if I go back and essentially confess, that's pretty damning. So should I go back and pay our tab? Edit, this all happened in Eastern Europe, a part of the EU. In all probability, over that small an amount, the police probably wouldn't care. The place might find it funny that you return to pay your tab. If you are worried, you can just tell them that you are used to the old system, you forgot to pay, here is the money. Yeah, and the server will be happy because she probably had to pay for those drinks. I doubt they had to pay it, that would be illegal in the EU. And someone else says, you go there more often than you say. If you don't go back to pay and they do remember, your next visit may be anywhere from uncomfortable from talking up to the local police. If you go to pay now, and they did get the cops involved, it may also be more difficult depending on which specific EU country. Just give them a call, explain, and tell them you'll be coming over to pay it. If they did make a police report, there's nothing you can do about that anymore, and the consequences will vary depending on the country. Updates. I felt really guilty, so I went back there around opening hours. They were extremely above and beyond nice about it. I apologized and explained the situation. They said it was nice of me to come back, but there was nothing missing from the till, so there is no bother. I'm pretty sure we didn't pay, so I insisted, but they were like, don't sweat it. If you really didn't pay, then this round was on the house. To be honest, I'm so embarrassed, I probably won't go back there for a long while, but I am glad I tried to do the right thing. Thanks for all the advice. And our next post by Chimster36. What an epic name. Drunk driver drove through my friend's house, almost killing her. Six months later, she has no compensation and is still struggling to afford to live. As the title says, six months ago, it was 3 a.m. in British Columbia, Canada, and my friend was asleep in bed in her house that she owns. A 19-year-old drunk driver plowed into her house. The car went through the ground floor, and she is lucky to be alive. The car demolished her bedside table, missing her bed by inches. The car couldn't be moved for almost a month, because the house may have fallen down due to how much damage that it caused. My friend shared the house with her brother and disabled mother, who she is a full-time carer to, on top of working as a teacher. Six months later, my friend had no compensation. She has spent all of her life savings dealing with the repercussions. She is still paying the mortgage on her place, which is completely unlivable, as well as rent on a temporary two-bedroom place for her and her mother to live. She is having to pay contractors herself to fix the house. All of this is incredibly expensive in Vancouver, Canada. She is a single salary teacher and is now having to borrow money from me in order to get by. If she didn't have friends to support her, it's very feasible her and her mother could be made homeless from this. The financial burden, as well as mental stress from nearly dying, and then being displaced, whilst also having to look after her wheelchair-bound mother, is monumental. The kid who drove the car is lawyered up to the eyeballs. The insurance company, ICBC, is being incredibly unhelpful. 
due to it being a drunk driving incident. The insurance company sent a representative to meet with my friend. I was present, and the rep admitted that, had the kid not been drunk, they would have paid out compensation quickly. Because it's a drunk driving case, they are saying the kid's insurance is invalid and they aren't willing to pay out quickly to my friend. My friend has met with a couple of lawyers, I wasn't present, and in her words, they said she has a clear case, but they didn't think they should take the case as they would charge a 30% fee and they may not be necessary. You see, this is the bit that I'm unsure of, as six months down the line, she has only been offered menial amounts by the insurance company, a couple of $1,500 checks that she hasn't cashed, and her and her wheelchair-bound mother are struggling to make ends meet. Any advice is greatly appreciated. I feel like this case is pretty specific to ICBC, a particularly poorly run insurance company with a monopoly in British Columbia. Recently, ICBC tried to wrongly blame the death of a police officer that was killed by a drunk driver on the dead police officer, just to give you a taste of how they operate. Firstly, your friend needs to stop talking to the insurance company's lawyer immediately. $1,500 is obviously not enough to cover serious damage to a house and her medical expenses, and any further conversations will only be to her detriment. They are not representing her interests, only their own. Second, your friend needs to go to an insurance company involved. The right place to start is probably the homeowner's insurance. She also should not cash any of the checks that ICBC has issued to date without first consulting her own insurance. Third, your friend needs to make a list of all the expenses that she has occurred. The most important step is to get her own insurance company involved. This is what you pay the premiums for. It becomes their problem instead of hers. Not sure why her homeowners hasn't been involved from day one. They pay up and go fight for their money back. But my rates will go up. Makes me bang my head. Why even pay for insurance if you don't use it in the situations where it makes sense? I've made claims for things where I was 100% not at fault, and my rates don't go up because the insurance company recoups their cost. My agent has told me over and over, they do not raise risk category unless they have to pay another party on behalf of their insured. This is the exact opposite of that. The homeowner is 1000% not at fault here, and there exists an at fault party with insurance to subrogate. OP should immediately involve her own homeowner's insurance, and they then deal with everything involved that the other party while her insurance pays to fix her house and any other damages. I do understand how widespread the fear is, however. One, as previously advised, itemize and keep track of all previous and current expenses. Two, make a claim through the homeowner's insurance ASAP. In some circumstances, the insurer may pay out the insured's claim and will subsequently pursue the driver. Three, retain a lawyer. I would strongly advise your friends to not represent herself. Furthermore, ICBC is a nightmare to deal with and therefore legal counsel will be necessary. Please also keep in mind the plaintiff has two years from the date of the accident to file a claim in court, for which your friend will need a lawyer. There is a lot of good advice in this thread, however, also a lot of bad advice. Therefore, a lawyer will be useful in answering your questions. With respect to the checks provided thus far, same can be deposited as long as the individual has not signed a settlement agreement or any release in exchange for the checks. I would further advise sending a letter to the insurer advising the checks are being deposited under protest, and therefore not representing any type of settlement nor an exchange for same. FYI, I am a lawyer in Alberta, I practice litigation. Good luck. And in that post, OP has an edit. First of all, I want to say thank you to everyone for all the advice. It is massively appreciated. I am currently traveling back to Canada and haven't had time to go through all this but it seems the biggest question is regarding her homeowner's insurance. I need to speak to my friend to confirm it, but from what I remember, she certainly has homeowner's insurance. She has attempted to get them involved, but they have also been very unhelpful. They have said they won't pay for certain things in the house, saying that even though it was destroyed, the place is over 10 years old, and so the valuations are ridiculously low. They have also tried to shift the responsibility to ICBC. My friend has set up meetings with five different lawyers to get one of them involved ASAP. Honestly everyone, I'm blown away by all this help. 
Thank you. I will go through all the messages once I get back to Vancouver tomorrow and respond as needed. Well, damn, that is a ridiculously sloppy situation. I really hope the OP in this one can help their friend out because who wants to be stuck in god like legal limbo like that person is. Anyway guys, I'm going to round out the episode there. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. Tell me what you thought about all of our topics we've covered in the comments down below. Tell me what you're up to today, I'd love to hear it. And as always guys, this has been Marky. Hope you have a good day, night, sleep, whatever you're up to, and I'll see you in the next episode. Bye!